Hello, my name is Felipe Gavilan and I welcome you to my C Sharp course, where you will learn many aspects of this important programming language from scratch. With C Sharp, we can do almost anything, like web applications, mobile applications, games, machine learning, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things applications, and much, much more. However, to reach those levels, we must first know the basics, and that is what this course is about. From basic to advanced, we are going to learn C Sharp. This course is mostly about understanding and writing code. All the concepts that we see are going to be accompanied by at least one example. Also, all the code we write will be at your fingertips in a repository, where you can download and run it, although I recommend that you write the code on your PC so that it helps you learn in it. This first module in which we find ourselves is introductory. We will talk about what is .NET, C Sharp, Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. We will see how to install Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, and we will learn how to create a simple console application with these tools. Then we will look at the structure of a typical c -sharp console project. So we are going to start this course off by talking about .NET. .NET is a development platform that is used to develop different types of applications. These applications will be able to run on Windows, Linux and Mac OS. Also, with .NET we can develop many types of applications, such as desktop applications, web applications, mobile applications, games, among many other options. It is important to note that .NET is not a programming language, but rather, as we said, it is an environment in which we can run different types of applications. When it comes to programming languages used for .NET, we have C Sharp, F Sharp, and Visual Basic. The most popular of the three is C Sharp, and it is the one that we're going to focus on this course. C Sharp is a multi paradigm language, although it is primarily known for being object oriented, just like Visual Basic, while F Sharp is what is known as a functional language. We will talk more about C Sharp in the next video. For now, I want to talk about the history of .NET. .NET was created by Microsoft in 2002 to run on Windows. The idea was to have a framework that would assist you when developing applications. This framework takes care of things like memory management, exception handling. It also allows you to write code in different languages which could communicate with each other. For example, we can call Visual Basic Code from C Sharp. Over the years, .NET has grown in both popularity and functionality. .NET made it all the way to version 4.8. However, a change in vision at Microsoft led to the conclusion that .NET should be open. It should not be a Windows-only framework, but should be cross-platform. In addition, it had to be faster and lighter. So, in 2014, .NET Core was announced. In other words, .NET Core is the evolution of .NET. We call the old version the .NET Framework, and it went all the way to version 4.8. .NET Core is the new version, and it came out in 2016 in its version 1. After that, new versions of .NET Core came out year after year, such as .NET Core 2 and .NET Core 3. However, to avoid any confusion, since the .NET framework made it to version 4.8, so people don't get confused with .NET Core 4, they skipped 4 and went straight to 5. But wait, there is more! Since the .NET framework never made it to version 5 and .NET Core did, the marketing geniuses at Microsoft decided to stop calling it Core and just call it .NET 5. So starting with .NET 5, we have .NET 6, .NET 7, .NET 8, and so on. A version of .NET is coming out in November of each year, so they have a predictable schedule of new versions. In conclusion, .NET Framework is the old version, which only runs on Windows, 
while .NET Core is the new version, which runs on different operating systems, and starting with version 5, it is called .NET 5 and not .NET Core 5. As we said in the previous video, in .NET we can use several programming languages such as C Sharp, F Sharp and Visual Basic. In this course, we are going to use C Sharp. C Sharp is a multi-paradigm programming language. It was created in the year 2000 by Microsoft. Although we can use different languages in .NET, C Sharp is the most used. C Sharp has a syntax like that of C++ and Java. With C Sharp, we can develop different types of applications, such as web applications, mobile applications that run on both Android and iOS. We can create interactive applications that run in a web browser with a technology called Blazor. We can also have desktop applications, games, and much, much more. Definitely, with C Sharp, you can program for a whole world of devices. As we said, C Sharp is multi-paradigm, which means that it allows the use of different programming paradigms, such as object-oriented programming and functional programming. In addition to this, C Sharp is a strongly typed language, which means that language rules can be enforced at compile time. So if you write invalid code in C Sharp, you will be able to tell immediately. As far as object-oriented programming is concerned, C Sharp is class-based. Most of the time that we develop C Sharp applications, we are going to be working in classes. With classes, we will be able to encapsulate parts of our application in units that contain data and behavior. The idea is that we'll be able to model the behavior of our programs in classes that interact with each other. For example, we are going to have classes that are going to be in charge of processing HTTP requests. Also, we are going to have classes that are going to work with accessing databases. Other classes will handle business logic, such as tax calculation. In this way, we are going to have an organized application, which makes it easier to develop. As far as the functional paradigm is concerned, C Sharp allows us to work with first class functions. When we talk about first class functions, we mean that we can perform operations such as passing functions as parameters to other functions, returning functions as a result of other functions, assigning a function to a variable, and even being able to work with anonymous functions. Something that we're going to see in this course is the use of link queue and lambda expressions, where we will use these features of functional programming to query collections. With link queue, we're going to make our life easy to perform certain operations. Link queue is even so powerful that we can combine it with a library called Entity Framework Core to query different types of databases such as SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, etc. with simple C Sharp code. As you can see, C Sharp is a broad programming language with which we can do many things. We have already talked about .NET and C Sharp. The next topic is what tool are we going to use to develop our applications? In general, we can use any text editor we want, including Notepad. However, I consider it better to use an Integrated Development Environment, IDE, since an IDE assists us when it comes to our developments. It contains tools that make our life easier when developing. Therefore, it is worth investing time learning how to use one. There are two main options for this course, Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio is a big leak IDE. It is quite powerful and popular in the .NET world. It's the default option for many people who develop in .NET. With Visual Studio, we can develop all kinds of .NET applications. We can use Visual Studio on Windows and Mac. There is no Visual Studio option for Linux. For Linux, we can use Visual Studio Code, which we will talk about in a moment. In this course, I am going to use Visual Studio. However, I am going to show you how to create a project in Visual Studio Code in case you want to use that technology. Visual Studio Code is a light and fast text editor. 
Visual Studio Code is famous in JavaScript environments where people develop applications with frameworks like Angular, Vue, React, among others. You can use Visual Studio Code on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Visual Studio Code uses extensions, so we can install tools that allows us to work with different technologies, including .NET. In this video, we are going to install Visual Studio on Windows. If you want to use Visual Studio Code, you can skip this video. So let's go to Google and let's put Visual Studio and the first link that you're going to get is visualstudio.microsoft.com. I'll click on here and in this page I can download Visual Studio. As you can see, we have three options, Visual Studio for Windows, Visual Studio for Mac and Visual Studio Code. In this video, we're going to focus on Visual Studio for Windows. So if I hover over this part, you are going to see that we have three versions of Visual Studio for Windows, Community, Professional, and Enterprise. The Community Edition is free, so we are going to be using that one for this course. So let me click on here, and that will start the download. I will click on here to open the executable. I will press Continue, and this is going to install the Visual Studio installer. And then we're going to get this workloads page. A workload in Visual Studio refers to a set of tools that we can use to do something. For example, if we want to develop SP.NET and web applications, we can install the SP.NET and web development workload. If we want to do Python development, we can install the Python development workloads and so on. In our case, we don't want to use Python development, so I will uncheck that. If you want to, you can leave this selected SP.NET and web development and also you can select .NET desktop development. With these two, we are good to go. There is nothing else that we need to install. So I am going to press install. This is going to install Visual Studio, but also will allow us to create C Sharp applications. This may take a while, so I will just pause the video and we will continue recording in a minute. All right, so as you can see, the installation has finished, so I can skip this for now. I will choose dark theme and start Visual Studio. And as you can see, we have Visual Studio installed. In this video, we are going to install Visual Studio code. For that, we are going to write Visual Studio on Google and we are going to go to visualstudio.microsoft.com. We are going to go down here and as you can see, we have three options. And at the right, we have Visual Studio Code. So we're going to come here and I'm going to download Windows 64 user installer. Now I will open this. I will accept next, 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 create desktop icon, next, install. And I will leave this as it is. So when I press finish, we get Visual Studio Code open. Let's create our first C Sharp application. For that, we are going to use Visual Studio. If you want to use Visual Studio Code, you can skip this video. So I will create a new project here. And as you can see here, we have a list of templates. With these templates, we can choose what kind of application we want to work on, like a web application, a desktop application, and so on. In our case, we want to use a console application. If you don't have it here, as you can see, it says console app. If you don't have it here, you can always come to here and write console, and you are going to filter all of the templates. As you can see here, we have console app, you have to choose the one that says C sharp here or here. Now let's click on next. We can put whatever name we want to our project. I can put my first app and then next I can choose .NET 7 and then I will click on create. And as you can see here, we have our C sharp code. It is fine if you don't understand what it does because that is what this course is about. What I want to do is that I want to run this code just to make sure that everything works okay. So what we're going to do is that we're going to come up here and we're going to press this button that is going to run our application. This is a console application, so 
we are going to be shown a console. And in the console, we are going to see some text written in it. And that text is hello world. Excellent. As you can see here, we have our application up and running. It was a simple application, so what comes after it is the typical message saying you that the application stopped. But that is fine. I can press any key to close the console and we can move on. In this video, we are going to create a new C Sharp application using the .NET CLI so that we can work with Visual Studio Code. The first thing that I need you to do is to press the window key and open a terminal. I can write CMD and open command prompt. And in here, I can write .NET dash dash version, enter. In my case, I have .NET 7 installed. If in your case, you don't have .NET 7 or you get an error, you need to do the following. You need to install .NET. For that, we can come to a browser. I will open dot, dot .NET, enter, and I'll come here and I'll click on download and I will download .NET 7. Of course, you can come to all .NET 7 downloads and you are going to get the different versions of .NET 7, like for Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. In my case, I will use Windows, so I will click on the 64 option. And then after that, I can click on here in order to install .NET 7. Of course, in my case, I already have it installed. So after you install, come back here and write again .NET dash dash version. And in that case, you should have .NET 7. Now, what we're going to do is that we're going to create a new C Sharp console application using this .NET CLI tool. For that, I recommend you to go to a folder in which you want to have your project created. In my case, I'll just do it here. So what I will do is that I will put this here and I'll say .NET new, enter. And as you can see, we have a list of templates of projects that we can create, like SP.NET Core, Web Application, Blazor Server Application, Class Library, Console Application, which is the one that we want to use, among others. Though, as we can see, if we say .NET New List, we are going to get all of the templates. So let me come here and let me say .NET New List, enter. And as you can see, we have way more options now. But again, in my case, what I want to do is to use a console application. So as you can see, in order to create a console application, I have to say .NET New Console. All right, so let me come here and let's say .NET New Console. I can say dash O, which means output, so that I can choose the name of the folder in which I want to put my project. So I can say my first app, enter, and that is going to create our project. And that is done. Now I can cd to my first app folder, first app, enter, and I can say code dot, which is going to open an instance of Visual Studio Code in this folder. I will say that I trust this so I can just use it without any issues. And as you can see, we can close this. And as you can see, we have this program CS file. And in here I have this code. If you get this suggestion to install the recommended extensions for C Sharp, say install. What this is going to do is that it will install this C Sharp extension, which will allow you to use Visual Studio Code for developing C Sharp application. As you can see, it says installing. And as you can see, it has finished. Another suggestion that you may get is for building and debugging applications. Don't worry if you don't know what build and debugging is. We are going to learn about that in the course. Just make sure to click on yes. And just in case you didn't get that message telling you about installing this C Sharp extension, it doesn't matter if you come here and let's go back to where we were. You can see that we can go to the extensions tab by coming here, extensions, and then in here, you can write C Sharp and you are going to get the C Sharp extension. You want the one that comes from Microsoft, by the way. Now let's come back here to program. 
and we have this code, we're going to see what this is about later in the course. For now, I just want you to run the application. So for that, we can use the terminal. So let's go to terminal, new terminal. And this is going to open a terminal that is located in my first app folder. So I will say .NET run, we're going to say .NET run in order to run our .NET application. Enter. And as you can see, we have hello world being displayed in the console. And that is exactly what this code does. What this code does is to write hello world in the console. A pretty simple application, but what is important here is that we were able to create a C-sharp project and run it. So we have an application, and as we can see, what we have here is a file called program.cs. That CS extension means C-sharp. So whenever you see a file with a CS extension, it means that it contains C-sharp code. This is an example of a file with C-sharp code. This is C-sharp code. The name of the file is program. There is a good reason why it is program, and that is that by default, a .NET application, the entry point of a .NET application is a class called program. So basically, this file is the entry point, which means that it is the first thing that gets executed when we run our program. That is why when we run our application in the past, we saw this code in the console because this is the entry point of the application and therefore this is what gets executed. I mentioned the word class just a few moments ago and that is a new concept for us and we're going to see what a class is later in the course. But basically, a class allows us to have code organized in units that have data and behavior. But again, we're going to see more about that later in the course. For now, let's see that we can come here to the Solution Explorer if we are in Visual Studio. In Visual Studio Code, you have all the files here at the left. In Visual Studio, we have the files here on the right in the Solution Explorer. Although I can drag this all over the place and put it wherever I want, for example here, if I want to, by default, this is located at the right side of the screen, so I will just leave it here. As you can see here, there is more to your application than a simple program file. You also have this solution, and you also have this thing here that says C Sharp and my first app. What is that? That is what is called a project. A project is a set of files that gets compiled into an executable or a DLL or library and things like that. So a project is a set of files that we're going to use for something. In our case, this project represents a console application and this file, which I can hover over here and see that this file is called my first app.csproj. That csproj, that csproj extension is the extension of a project file that determines what our project is about. In our case, as you can see here, we are outputting an executable. We are targeting .NET 7, and we also have some more configuration that we're going to learn more about later in this course. But for now, I wanted you to see that we have a project here. We have more than this simple program file. And I just mentioned that a project produces something like a console application or a library. What is a library? A library is a set of code that we can reuse between different applications. For example, if I have some code that do tax calculations, I can put that in a library so that that code can be used among many projects. Like I can use that code in my console application, I can use that code in a web application, I can use that code in a mobile application, etc., etc. Now, when you have several projects, you organize them in a solution. As you can see here, we have a solution. A solution is just a collection of projects, typically projects that are related together. 
If, for example, the solution is about a business application that has to do business tasks like calculating taxes, the payroll of employees, and so on, we may have several projects in this solution. But if also my company has another software that is a game, we are probably not going to have it on the same solution because maybe my game doesn't have to do anything with my business application. That is just an example, of course. What I mean by all of this is that we can have projects which produces something like an executable or a library like a DLL, which has some code that I can share among many applications. And we have a solution which allows us to group together several projects. An analogy would be that a solution is like a house that groups together rooms and the projects are the rooms of the house. You can have several rooms that serve different purposes and they are all organized inside of the house. Now, I have been telling you that a project produces something. Now, where is that something that gets produced? Where is my application? Where is my executable? Well, for that, we can right-click on this project here, and I can click on Open Folder in File Explorer, and what this is going to do is that it is going to open in the Windows Explorer where my project is located. This is my csproj file and this is my c -sharp file. In here, we have this bean folder. This bean folder, where bean means binaries, is where the output of my project gets located. Let's see that. Let's go to bean. Let's go to debug. Again, later in the course, you are going to learn what debug is, but in this case, you can think of debug as a test version of your application, like not the final version, the final and optimized version. This is a test version that is useful for testing, development, and so on. So let's go here. You have here .NET 7, which is the version of .NET that we're using. Let's click on here. And as you can see here, we have a DLL, but what is important is that we also have this which is an executable. If we right click on it and go to properties, we're going to see that this is an executable. Now, if I double click on it, we saw a console application that opened and closed really fast. Why is that? Well, because if we go back to Visual Studio, we are going to see in our program file that all this application does is to write something in the console and it immediately closes. That is why we don't even have time to see Hello world in the console. There are many tricks to avoid this to happen, to avoid the console being closed immediately. What we're going to do, because we're just getting started, is that we're going to keep it simple. I'll press shift, right click, open PowerShell window here so that we have this terminal. And I'm going to write the name of my project, which is my first app. I'll press tap, tap, X, I will execute the executable, I'll press enter, and as you can see, we have hello world here, which means that indeed, this executable is what is being produced from our c -sharp code, from our c -sharp project. So with this introduction, we are ready to start this course. I'll see you in the next module. In this module, we saw that .NET is a platform where we can develop and run applications that can run on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. C Sharp is a multi-paradigm language with which, thanks to the power of .NET, we can develop web, desktop, mobile, and game applications, among many other things. Visual Studio is a major league IDE which assists us when developing applications. In this course, we will use it to work with C Sharp. Visual Studio is only available for Windows and Mac OS. Visual Studio Code is a fast and lightweight text editor. Visual Studio Code is available for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. It is ideal for those who need a work tool that is not as heavy as Visual Studio or that it works on Linux. We learned that every C-sharp project has a program class, 
which is basically the first thing that is executed when we run a C-sharp application. It is like the entry point of our program. We also saw that a project refers to a set of files that we can compile into a deliverable, such as a library, a web page, a mobile application, a console application, among others. A solution refers to a set of projects. This is important because sometimes we will want to have related projects organized in one place. Hello, my name is Felipe Gavilan and in this module we are going to talk about variables. Variables are a fundamental aspect of C-sharp because they allow us to have information in memory with which we can perform operations. We are going to talk about top-level statements, basic C-sharp syntax, variables, data types such as integers, floating point numbers, booleans, strings, and dates. Also, we'll talk about null, nullables, and non-nullable reference types. After that, we will look at expressions, binary and unary operations, and finally, we will look at warnings and errors. Let's start by creating the project of this module. Let's create the project of this module. For that, we are going to go to create a new project. We are going to select console app. Remember that you can filter here if you need to. I'll click on next. I'll name this project variables. Next. And we are met with this option of do not use top level statements. We are going to see more about that in the next video. For now, I'll just leave it unchecked and I will click on create. And we're ready to start. When we create a new console application, we're being met with this program file. In the previous module, I mentioned you that this was the program class. And as we can see, it contains this text, which is a comment. And we know it's a comment because it starts with two slashes and also it has this line of C-sharp code, which again, as we saw in the previous module, we saw that it allowed us to write hello world in the console. We call this presentation style of this file a top level statement. And basically the idea is that it allows us to cut out the ceremony, the typical ceremony that we need in order to have a functioning class in C-sharp. If you have worked in the past with languages like C Sharp and Java, you know that even for doing the smallest thing, you have to write a lot of code. For example, I will create a new project, a new console application project that is not going to use top level statements so that you can see the difference. Let me go to the solution explorer, right click on the solution, add new project, remember that a solution is just a collection of projects, so in this solution that we have, we can add as many projects as we want. Like I can have two console apps or three console apps and more. So let me click on next. I'll say variables without top level statements. Next, and I'll choose do not use top level statements. Create. Now we have here basically the same code that we have here at least this console right line hello world which again don't worry i'll teach you all about this in the upcoming lectures but for now you're going to see that this code is repeated here as you can see but there is also a lot more code there is this namespace internal class program a static void main a string and this thing that we haven't learned what it is arcs and so 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 much code than what we have here that is the code that i was mentioning that is part of the ceremony of having minimal functioning code in c sharp here while declaring the namespace in which this class lives and this is the method in which this code is contained we are going to see more about namespaces and classes and methods in this course the reason why I like to use top level statements is so that we can only focus on the code because this is the code that is going to get executed. Just like here, this is the code that we want to execute. This is the code that we actually want to do something. 
Sure, of course, all of this is important. What I'm saying is that right now it is not that important and I would prefer to concentrate only on the code that we're going to execute, the code that we're going to run, and then later in the course, we're going to learn more about methods and about classes and about namespaces. So that is why I prefer to use top level statements. Now, it is important to note that top level statements only apply to the program class. The reason for that is because that by default, the file with top level statements like this one is going to be the entry point of our application. And one application can only have one entry point. Again, the entry point of an application is the code that is going to get executed when we run our program. And because of this, then we can only have one file with a top level statement. If I create a new class in this project, in this variables project that we have here, it is going to look a lot like this code that we have here. We can see an example of that. Let's go to the solution explorer. I will right click on variables, add class. I'll just say example. So again, we have some of the code that we have here in this program class without the top level statement. So as you can see, even in this project, in this variables project in which we have top level statements activated, only the program class is the one that uses top level statements. When we have another class like example, we have all of the typical ceremony of creating a class. Now again, we are getting ahead of ourselves. We don't even know what a class is. We're going to learn that later in this course. I just wanted to show you what was the difference between an application without top level statements and an application with top level statements. So let me close this and this because we're not really going to be using that. We're only going to be using this variables project. Here we can see basic C sharp syntax. We can see, as we mentioned before, a comment, but we also can see an example of an statement. An statement is an action that we want our program to do. In this case, we have that we want to write in the console, we want to write a new line of text, and that text is hello world. And we can see that at the end of this statement, we have a semicolon. A statement ends with a semicolon. And this is mandatory. If I remove this semicolon from here, we are going to see that we get this red squiggly line here. This red squiggly line indicates that there is an error. Now, what is the error? Well, for one, I can try to hover over the line and we're going to get semicolon expected, which, as you may guess, means that we are missing a semicolon. Now, we can also see this error in the error list down here. If you don't have it here, you can always find that tab in view error list. Let me click on here. And as you can see, we have semicolon expected in the variables project in the file program in line two. As you can see here, we have the line number of this line of code. Now, even if I am outside of this file, I can see the error. Let's see that. I will press control S to save. And as you can see, just in case you didn't notice, as you can see, we have this little asterisk here indicating that there are pending changes in this file to be saved. If I save control S, you are going to see that we don't have that asterisk anymore. So what I was saying was, let me close this and I can still go to the error list. And from here, I can double click and I will be taken into the line of code that has the error. This is very handy and you should get used to using it. Now, if I put back the semicolon, we're going to see that the error will go away. The red squiggly line will go away. We have no issues found here, which means that everything is good. I want to make a new statement. Now, sadly, we know very little about C-sharp, so there is not much I can do. So what I will do is that I will basically repeat this. So let me say here, 
console.write line and we are going to talk more about all of this later. But let me just write here, I am Felipe Gavilan, which is my name. And let's not forget semicolon here. So as you can see, console dot write line parenthesis quotation marks my text that text that I want to write into the console quotation marks that means the end of this text that I was writing parenthesis again and then the semicolon if I run my application we are going to see that we have this new line of text in the console in order to run my application I can either click on here or go to debug start debugging or start without debugging we're going to learn the difference between those two later in the course but for now i can either click on here or just press ctrl f5 i'll just click on here and as you can see here we have hello world and i am felipe gavilan now let me do something let me press enter and let us see that we can put this like this as you can see we have the two statements in the same line we have this first statement and we also have this second statement and if i press ctrl f5 you are going to see that everything still works now this may not be really easy to read so in general it is advised to have only one statement per line there may be exceptions to this quote-unquote rule but in general we prefer to use this style of coding so that we can see better what we are doing i want to give you a heads up because this is a course i want you to have access to all of the code that i do in this course so that is why we have a github repository for this course now where is the code going to be located well for that what i'm going to do is that i will create a code folder in our project we have this variables project i will create a code folder a folder simply allows us to have files in it just like a normal windows folder and in here i will create a class with a name that is going to be similar to the name of the video for example the previous video was about statements so i will name this a statements enter and in here i will write some code that you may not understand now i will say public void the code and then i will put a block of code and inside of this block of code i will put whatever code i write in the video so for example i will put that here and so if in the future you want to access the code maybe because you don't want to write it you can just go to the github repository you can go to the project you can go to the code folder and you will be able to see all of the code that i write by video separated by video though if you allow me to i advise you that you write this code for yourself because that will allow you to master the c-sharp syntax better but again i will put the code in the github repository for your reference now this is something that i will do behind the scenes you will not see me doing this every single time that i finish a video but i wanted you to know so that you know where to find the code let's talk about the dot operator as you may guess a software may do a lot of things a software may have functionality for calculating taxes, a software may have functionality for streaming a movie. So there is a lot that can be done within a program. A program can do a lot of things. Now, that lot of things have to be organized in places. Just like in a Word document, you don't have everything on the same page. The same goes for an application. You don't have every piece of functionality on the same file so we divide our program and we can separate our c -sharp program in classes we don't know yet what is a class but for now you can think of a class as a unit that contains both information or data and functionality now console is an example of a class if you hover over console you can see that it says class system.console console is the name of the class 
We are going to learn more about this system later in the course, but for now, just know that console is a class. So that means that there is probably data inside of the console class and there is also functionality inside of the console class. Now, how do I access that data or functionality of the console class? Well, using the dot operator. So the dot operator allows me to access what is known as the members of the class. When we talk about members, we are talking about different manifestations of data and functionality that exists inside of a class. So as you can see, we say console dot, which means that I want to access a member of the console class and that member is right line which by its name, you can guess that it's about writing a new line, writing a line. Now in C Sharp, in order to execute a piece of functionality, you have to use parentheses. In more technical terms, when we use parentheses, we are saying that we want to invoke something, in this case, a method or a function, if you prefer to call it that way, a function or method we are going to execute, we are going to invoke the functionality that it is inside of this right line method. So after we open parentheses, we have the option to pass information into that method, into that piece of functionality. And in our case, what we are doing is that we are passing text. Again, in more technical terms, this text is called a string what we are passing is a string and we know that it is a string because it is text that is contained between quotation marks as you can see here we have a quotation mark then we have some text and then again we have another quotation mark indicating that this is the end of the text the end of the string and after that we close the parenthesis and we put a semicolon because we are finishing a statement now inside of this quotation marks, I can put whatever I want. I can put I am Claudia, for example, semicolon, my age is one, two, three. Now notice something very important. This semicolon here is different than this semicolon that we have here. Why is that? Well, as we said before, everything that is inside this quotation marks is simple text, is a simple piece of information. Now. This semicolon that is here is outside of quotation marks, which means that it is C-sharp code. So the difference is between these two semicolons is that this one is just text, this one is just information, and this one is C-sharp code. So let me run my application by pressing Ctrl F5. And as you can see, indeed, we have semicolon here because this semicolon does not mark the end of an statement but actually it's just text inside of a string. Now let me press enter and let's move on. We saw that we can organize our code in classes. Now inside of those classes we can also organize our code in this case using blocks of code. The idea of a block of code is to allow us to separate sections of code, portions of code. And in order to define a block of code, we use curly brackets. For example, if I come here, I can put curly brackets. And in here I have created, I have created a new block of code. And inside of this block of code, I can put code. If you remember, we have already seen this in the past. Remember that we created another project, variables without top level statements, and if we expand on it and we go to the program class, we are going to see several blocks of code. We can see an example of a block of code here. We can see another example of another block of code here and so on. Blocks of code are important to define, for example, what is inside of a class. So as you can see here, we are defining the program class. We are saying class program. And what is inside of this class? Well, whatever is inside this block of code that we are defining here. And here we are defining something that is called a method, 
which is a piece of functionality. And as you can see, we define what is part of that method by using another block of code. So as you can see, block of code are a fundamental part of C Sharp because it allows us to define what belongs to who. Now let me close this because this was just a demonstration. What I want to do is to use this block of code, which is not really going to do anything, but it will allow us to practice. So what I will do is that inside of this block of code, I will write some code. I will write console write line, which again is the only thing that we know how to do in C sharp. And I will say this code is in a block, in a block of code, semicolon here. And then after that, if I want, I can write another sentence, console write line. And by the way, notice that when we write console dot, we can see a list of all of the members of the console class. This is really helpful. This is called, by the way, this is called IntelliSense. IntelliSense basically assists us when we write code. This is why I was mentioning in the beginning of this course that using an IDE like Visual Studio makes our life easier when developing. So let's continue. Let's say right line and I can say this code is not in a block. Now, if we execute our code, we're going to see that we have our four lines of text here. Let me press enter. And now I want you to notice something else, and is that we have this a space here by default. This is called indentation. Indentation allows us to separate visually code that belongs to a block of code. For example, it is really easy for us to determine that this line of code is inside of a block of code. Why? Because it is indented, as you can see here. And if we go back to the program class, in the other project, we are going to see that we have several levels of indentation. We have namespace, whatever that is. We don't know what that is in this moment, and that doesn't matter because we're going to learn more about that later. But we can see that inside of the namespace, we have this program class and it has some indentation. And then inside of this class, we have this method, this main method, and it has more indentation that again allows us to visually see that this method belongs to this class. And we can see that also this line of code has some indentation and it has a level of indentation that allows us to see that this code belongs to this main method that we have here. This is different than having something like this. If I do this, if I start doing this, if I eliminate all of the indentation, then it is quite hard to know what is going on here. It is not as easy as it was before to see that this class belongs to this namespace and this method belongs to this class because there is no help from indentation. And something that I can do instead of Visual Studio to fix this is to say Control K, Control D, and it is going to automatically indent my code. So again, let me close this and let's come back here and let's move on. Let's talk about comments. As we can see here, we have an example of a comment. In order to write a comment, you can write two slashes and that text that you write after that is called a comment. Comments are important in order to clarify our code. Comments are important to explain what the code is doing. For example, I could come here and write something like this code writes a message in the console. Now, somebody that sees this code will know what this line of code does. Now, of course, you don't have to write a comment for every single line of code in your application but there are some lines, there are some pieces of code that needs a comment so that folks can understand the context or the reason why something was done. For example, this may seem like unnecessary code. This may seem like an unnecessary block of code. But if I write here, I did this 
to explain to my students what a block of code is. Now people when seeing this code will say, oh, okay, I understand that this may not seem necessary, but there is a reason why this is here, so I should not delete it. Comments are a way for communicating either with other people or with yourself in the future. Because if you have a code that is kind of difficult to understand, even if you understand it now, it may be a good idea to write a comment explaining what the code does so that in the future, maybe six months in the future, if you see that code again, you can immediately remember what the code does. Please do not lie to yourself thinking that you are going to remember what that code does, because usually that is not the case. And I say that from experience. Now, besides being able to write comments in a single line, you can write multiple lines of code. One way would be to say, this is line two of the comment, and that is fine, but you can also do the following. You can also say a slash asterisk, asterisk a slash, and whatever you write inside of this is a comment. For example, let me say, this is a multi-line comment. As you can see here, I can write a multi-line comment by using this code. It is important to note that comments do not get executed. What gets executed are lines of code like this one, statements, classes, methods, and all of those good stuff but comments do not get executed. This means that you don't have to worry about making your software slower because you write a lot of comments. That is not going to happen. On the contrary, when our application compiles, and compiling means when we take the C-sharp code and transform it into the deliverable that our project outputs, the comments will get removed. So this means that no matter how many comments you write, your program will not get any slower because of it, and it will also not get bigger. Finally, we can see that even Microsoft comments their code. If we hover over right line, we're going to see that we have writes the specified string value. This is an example of a comment that was written by Microsoft, and it explains what the write line functionality does. So this is very useful if there is a piece of functionality that you don't know what it does. You can check if it has a comment and then you can read the comment and hopefully you will understand better what the code does. It is also important to know that C Sharp is case sensitive, which means that it is not the same to write code using uppercase than lowercase, for example, we have here right line, right? If I say right line all in uppercase, then as you can see, we have an error. We have an error because again, C sharp is case sensitive, which means that this is not the same as this right line. These two are different because they have different casing for some letters. And whether it is all of the name that you write in uppercase or that you write it in lowercase, right line like this, it is again not the same as this. They are not the same thing. They are a very different thing. This doesn't exist. There is no member of the console class that is called right line with lowercase w and lowercase l. And even if you just say uppercase w but lowercase l, it is still not the same. You have to write it correctly. You, you have to write the correct casing for every single letter of the name of the member, in this case, lowercase l. And as you can see now, we have that this works. We don't have any more the red squiggly line, which means that we are good to go. It is time for us to do more in our program than just writing console right line over and over. We're going to learn about variables. So let me clean this up a little bit and let's see what a variable is. A variable allows us to save data in memory. When we talk about data, 
We talk about a piece of information like my name Felipe or my age or my address or a date. All of that information can be stored in a variable. And if you notice, I just mentioned different kinds of information like name, age, which is a number, and dates. In order to store different kinds of information, we have to use different data types. The idea of a data type is that it defines what kind of information can a variable store. For example, we can use the string data type in order to store text into a variable. We saw an example of a string before when we said that in order to have this text here, we enclose it in quotation marks. This is what defined a string. We can also have numbers by using, for example, the int data type or integer data type. Now, before creating our first variable, let me just say something about our definition of a variable in which we said that with a variable, we can store data in memory. When we say in memory, we mean that it is not permanent or in more technical terms, it is not persisted. It is information that we're going to have at hand when we are running the program, but if we close the program, that information will be lost if it is not persisted. When we talk about persistence, what we're referring to is if we store the information in a place so that that information can later be retrieved. For example, a database, a text file, and so on. So variables allows us to have data in memory. Let's see an example of a variable. We're going to start with number variables, specifically whole numbers or integers. As I said before, in order to have an integer variable, we use the int data type. So we say int of integer in order to define the data type of the variable that we're about to create. Let's say that in this variable, I want to hold my age. So I'll write here age, which is the name of the variable. As you can see, a variable can have a data type, which signifies what kind of data can the variable hold. And also we have a name for the variable. The name is really important because it is what describes what the variable holds. In this case, I'm saying that this variable is going to store the age of something, maybe my age, maybe your age or whatever, but it is an age. It is important to use clear names for variables so that we know what they are about. For example, I shouldn't say int first name. Why shouldn't I say this? Although this is valid C sharp code, it doesn't make sense for a first name to be a number. First name should be text, so the data type should be a string. So even though I am allowed to do this, doesn't mean that it is a good idea. So let me go back and put age. And then because this is an statement, I have to say semicolon here. And as you can see, this is an example of declaring a variable. We are here declaring a variable, the age variable, which is of data type int. As you can see here, below the name of the variable, we have a green squiggly line, signifying that we have a warning, not an error, but a warning. A warning is just like a message warning us about something that may be wrong, but that thing that may be wrong will not stop our application from running. So what the warning says is that the variable age is declared but never used. Of course, we are declaring the variable, but we are not doing anything with it. So Visual Studio is warning us that, hey, if you are going to create this variable, at least use it or remove it. Because right now it is garbage code. It is code that does not do anything. So something that I can do is to initialize this variable. In order to initialize a variable, which just means assigning a value to it, we can say the name of the variable, the equal sign, and then a value, a valid value. For example, in age, I can put something like 99. This is again a statement, so I have to say semicolon here. And now the age variable is equal to 99. Now, the good thing about a variable is that we can use it in many places. The idea is that we can centralize a piece of information in one place, in one variable, and then we can reuse that variable in many places in our application. For example, I can come here and I can say console write line and I can pass the age variable. And if I press control F5 to run our application, 
we are going to see that indeed we have 99 in the console. And if tomorrow I want to change this for another value, like 999, then that value, that change of value is going to get propagated throughout our whole application. Now, of course, our application is very small, so it doesn't seem like we have a big advantage here, but in the future, when we have a big application having centralized data, so that changes to that data can be propagated throughout the whole application, it's going to be crucial to have a maintainable application. Now, if we press Ctrl F5 one more time, we're going to see that indeed we have 999 in the console because this change was propagated to the whole application. Now, something else that I can do is that I can declare, this is declare, we are declaring the variable and here we are initializing the variable. We can do that in a single line. I can say, for example, int height in centimeters and I can say equal to, let's just say 135 semicolon and again we have that we have declared and initialized this height in centimeters variable. And of course, since we're not using the variable, we have this warning here, which says that that variable is assigned, but its value is never used. And if we go here and we use that variable, let's say height in centimeters, semicolon, you can see that the warning disappears. We know that in order to represent integers in C sharp, we can use the int data type. Now, that is not the only way to represent a whole number. There are actually several data types that allows us to represent an integer, and they are called integral numeric types. Int is one of them, but it's not the only one. So what I will do is that I will delete this, and let's see another integral numeric type, and that is byte. Byte is a data type that allows us to store a whole number that goes from 0 to 255. So I can say, for example, byte 1 for the name of the variable, and I can say a value like 130. And again, this one goes from 0 to 255, which is very different from what we had with integers. Let me say int 1, and let me just say a value like 5 million. This is very different because remember that we saw that this one goes from minus 2 billion to approximately 2.1 billion. Now, the difference between these two, besides the maximum and minimum value, is the amount of memory that they occupy. A byte occupies one byte of memory, of course, one byte of memory. Meanwhile, an integer occupies four bytes of memory. So as you can see, int occupies four times the space of a byte. Now this doesn't mean that you have to use bytes for everything that does not go up to 255, like it doesn't mean that you should say something like byte age and let's say 25 just because you know that the age of a person will certainly never go all the way to 255, so that you should use byte for age. That is not the case. This is not necessary. You can use an int for an age. You can say int my age, 25, and that is fine. Four bytes of memory is not going to make the difference in your application, so you don't need to overdo it. But when we talk about collections of numbers, then using a byte may make a difference. For example, in the future, when we talk about files and opening files with C Sharp and creating files with C Sharp, we are going to use collections of bytes. Because sure, one integer or one byte does not make a difference. But when you have a million of integers versus a million of bytes, then it is definitely worthwhile to use byte in that scenario. So with that said, let's move on. There are more data types for integers. Another one is called signed byte. So let's say s byte, s byte one, and this one goes from minus 128 to 127. So for example, I can say here minus 100, and that is fine because this goes from here to here. And this also occupies 
one byte of memory. The difference between these two, as you can see, is that this one allows for negative numbers. Another data type that we can use is short. Short goes from minus 32,000 to 32,000. So let me say something like 25,000, and that is fine, because this goes from here to here. And this one occupies two bytes of memory. So the double than a byte and half of an integer. We also have use short, which comes from unsigned short, which is basically short without the negative numbers. So I can say without any issues, a number like 60,000, and there is no problem with that. These are the limits. And again, this uses the same two bytes of memory. Then we have integers. We already know about int, but we also have uint, which as you may guess, it is unsigned integer. So we can say u int one, and we can even say a bigger number than this one. For example, I can say this without this, like this. And I can say, for example, three billion, and there is no problem with this because this one goes from zero to approximately 4.2 billion. And it occupies the same four bytes of memory. And finally, we have long. So let me say long one, and I can put a bigger number than this one, like for example, 300 billion. And there is no problem with this because this one goes from these two numbers, which I am not going to pronounce. And it occupies eight bytes of memory. And we also have U long, which is unsigned long, which basically ditches negative numbers. So I can even say a bigger number than this one. For example, I can copy this. Let me just replace these four underscores. And I can say, for example, 17 here, which is bigger than this. And there is no problem with that because this number can go from zero to this really big number. And again, it occupies eight bytes of memory. So let me say here, eight bytes of memory. So in real life, you are probably going to use three, which are byte, int, and long. Byte, for example, for a collection of bytes to represent a file, long for really big numbers, like for example, the amount of views of a video in YouTube is a place where we can use long, and for everything else, we are probably going to use integers. Besides working with integers, we can work with real numbers. Real numbers are those that have decimal parts. For example, 1.2. In order to work with real numbers in C-sharp, we have three data types, float, double, and decimal. The difference between them is the amount of memory they occupy. Let's see an example of each one. Let me delete all of this. Let's start with a float. Let's say, for example, height, and I will say 180.12, semicolon, and I will say occupies four bytes of memory and it has a precision of six to nine digits. We're going to see an example of what happens when we exceed this limit. Now, as you can see here, we have an error. Why is this? Let's hover over here and see what this error is about. It says literal of type double cannot be implicitly converted to type float. What does this mean? Well, if we keep reading, we're going to see use an F suffix to create a literal of this type. What this is saying is that we have this number here, but by default, C sharp treats it like a double. Remember that we said that we have float, double and decimal. Well, by default, a real number in C sharp is of type double. If I want to make it a float, I have to use a suffix here of F. And now, as you can see, we don't have any errors. So the error was complaining that if we do this, then this literal, this is called a literal, which is basically a constant value. So the literal that we put here has to match the data type that we put here. In our case, this is a literal for doubles, but this is a float variable. So there is a mismatch and that is why we have an error. So again, in order to specify that this literal is for floats, we have to use the F suffix, which can be in lowercase or uppercase. It doesn't make any difference. Something that I want to tell you is that this is just for C-sharp. This is just for indicating that this data type is a float. 
If you show this number to the user, the user is not going to see the F. They are not going to see this F. They are only going to see the number, which is what you want them to see. Let's see that. Let's say console. I want to say console, right line. And I want to say the height is semicolon and then console, right line. And I will put here the height, semicolon here, control F5 to run my application. And we're going to see that indeed we have the height is 180.12. And we don't have the F here because that is only for C sharp. That is not for presentation purposes. Now, I was telling you that we're going to test these limits. For example, let's say that I put here 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. What are we going to get? Well, if we run our application, we're going to see that we have 180, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6. What is this? Why do we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 6 instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9? Because again, as we said, there is a limit of the amount of digits that we can represent in a float. So what we have here is a rounded representation of this number. As you can see here, we have one, two, three, four, and six. We have six here because here we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So it cuts here in this five, but after that five, we have a six, which means that this number gets round up to six. So that is why we have one, two, three, four, six. Now, if we want more precision, if we need more precision, we can use another data type called double. So let me close this and let's come here and let's say double. Let's say width, for example. Let's say 45.12 and let me say that this double occupies eight bytes, which is the double of a float. And the precision is of 15 to 17 digits. So way bigger than a float. Now, notice something, notice that I didn't have to use a suffix here because by default, a literal like this is a double. Now, if I wanted to, I could put a D here for a double, but this is not necessary, so we're going to remove it. Now, let me say here, console right line, console right line with, and let me say console right line, the width is semicolon, and Control F5 to run our application. And let's see that we have 45.12. Okay, now let's do the same experiment that we did here. Let me copy this and let me paste it here, only in the decimal part here. And let's see what we get. Let's press Control F5 to run our application. And we're going to see that indeed we have more precision here. As you can see, we have numbers from one all the way through nine here because we have more precision so we can be more exact about the number that we're going to represent. Now, sadly, there is a problem with both float and double and that is that they represent numbers using base two. But in our world, we use numbers with base 10. The problem with float and double is that since they use base two, it means that what they store is an approximation of this number. And since it is an approximation, we can have errors, just like we saw here, that because it is an approximation, we didn't have quite the exact same number. But what if we want to use a real number with base 10? Well, for that, we can use decimal. It is recommended that we use decimal for things that are related to money, just like amounts, loans, interest rates, and so on, because this is the most exact data type. And when we are dealing with money, we have to be very careful with not having errors due to approximations, just like we had with the height value here. So let me say here, for example, amount 9.99. And in order to use a literal for decimal, we have to use the M suffix. So this one occupies 16 bytes, but the precision is of 28 to 29 digits. As you can see, it's the most precise one. And let me put here in parentheses that it is recommended 
for things related to money. So whenever you have to do something that's related to money, whenever you have to store a value that's related in some way to money, please, please, please use that decimal data type so that you don't get into troubles. So just for completeness, let me duplicate this and let's say the amount is, and let's put amount here. And let's see that if I press control F5, you are going to see that we indeed have 9.99. Now in real life, you're probably going to use decimal a lot. And whenever you don't need that much precision, you may use double, but there are scenarios in which even float is useful. And that is just like we said with bytes that we can have collection of bytes. There are scenarios in which you need to have a collection of real numbers. And that is an a scenario in which using float may be worthwhile. For example, in machine learning datasets, you may have thousands or even millions of real numbers and using float to represent them can definitely save some memory. Let's talk about booleans. Booleans are a useful data type that allows us to save information about if something is true or false. So it's basically like a yes or no, like is two plus two equal to four? Yes or true. Is my name Robert? False. My name is Felipe and so on. So let me delete this and let's see that in order to declare a Boolean variable, we use bool. And then for example, I am Felipe, that's true, or bool two plus two equals five. That is false. So I can say false. Now this is going to be crucial for developing applications because something that we will be able to make in the future is to take decisions based on the value of a Boolean. For example, I have this block of code here and I will be able to say execute this code if my name is Felipe. So if my name is Felipe, this block of code is going to get executed. And if my name is not Felipe, then this block of code is not going to get executed. That is something that we're going to see in the future. And that is going to be one use case for booleans. In order to store text in a variable, we can use two data types, char and a string. Let's see them. Let me delete this and let's start with char. Char basically allows me to store a single character. So let me say char first letter of ABC is single quotes A. And this is the char literal. So I can come here and say console write line and print that out into the console. Let's see that indeed we have here a now HR variable can only contain a single character. If I write another character like B, then we get an error. As you can see here, we have an error that says too many characters in character literal because we only can have one character in a char variable. If we want to have many characters, we can use a, a string. A string is just a collection of characters that are represented in a way that is really simple to read. Let's see that. Let's say a string, first name. And in order to use a string, we use double quotes. And we are going to say Felipe, semicolon here. But in reality, this is just a collection of chars. So this is the F char, the E char, the L char, and so on all the way through all of the characters of my string. We're going to see this in the future when we learn more about loops, where we're going to iterate a string and we're going to see that a string is just a collection of characters, a collection of chars. Now, of course, I can come here and I can say console write line first name control F5 to run our application. And as you can see, we have Felipe. Of course, that text that I put here can be as long as I want to. I can say, for example, long text and I can put here a lot of text and there is no problem with that. I can put whatever I want. I can even put a book here. And there is no problem with that, of course, 
my application is going to be, it's going to occupy a lot of memory if I put a book in a variable, but that doesn't matter because what is important for us to know is that we can put any kind of text inside of a string variable. And of course, if I come here and I say console right line and I say long text, console F5, we're going to see that indeed I was able to store this very long text into my stream variable. In order to put special characters in a string, we have to use a escape sequence. Let's see an example of that. Let me delete this and this from here, and I will just keep this long text string. And let me say here, my friend once told me you are very cool. That was nice. So control F5 to run our application. And we're going to see that we have my friend once told me you are very cool. That was nice. Now, what if I don't want to use single quotes, but I want to use double quotes here. Let me close this and let's try that. Let's say that I don't want single quotes, but double quotes. And let's put here double quotes. And as you can see, we have an error. Why do we have an error? Well, because you know that we use double quotes to mark the beginning and the end of a string. And if I put double quotes here, then C Sharp thinks that I want to finish this string here. And now I have this text, you are very cool here, that is not inside of the double quotes of a string. So we have an error. So what can we do? Well, for that, we can use a escape sequence. A escape sequence is a series of characters that is going to output something. In our case, if we want to output a double quote inside of a string, I have to use backlash. And for a backlash, I have to say Alt 92, at least in Windows. So with this escape sequence, this is an example of a escape sequence. With this escape sequence, backlash double quote, we are outputting a single double quote. And let's do the same here because I have another double quote that I want to have in the string as text. So let me say Alt 92 for a backlash. And now I have no errors. So I can press Control F5 to run our application. And we're going to see that indeed we have my friend once told me and you are very cool inside of double quotes. So again, we use escape sequences to output special characters that would otherwise be impossible to put in a string. Another special character that we may want to put inside of a string is the backlash itself. Let's see that. Let me say a string long text to equal to we use the backlash to start escape sequences. Now, the backlash itself is a special character. And in order to output that we need to have a escape sequence and the escape sequence in order to output a backlash is to have two backlashes. So if I say Alt 92, once again, we have two backlashes. But since this is a escape sequence, this is only going to output a single backlash. Let's see that. Let me come here console right line, long text two, semicolon, control F5 to run. And let's see that indeed we have, we use backlash to start escape sequences. There is another kind of a string literal that we can use to have a string across several lines and also a string that allows us to skip some escape sequences. And that is the verbatim string literal. Let's see an example. Let me delete this. And let me say that I want to have a letter here, letter. And if I want to do the following, if I want to say to whom it may concern, comma, and then I try to hear inside of the string, as you can see here, if I try to say enter, you are going to see that automatically I get this plus sign and these double quotes here. This is Visual Studio helping me having a string separated in different lines. But let's say that I don't want to do this. And by the way, we're going to see more about this operation in the future. But let's say that I don't want to do this. Let's say that I want to put my semicolon here and I want to have my string across many lines. For that, we can use a verbatim string literal. And for that, I can put here a prefix of an at sign. And that's it. With this, we have a verbatim string. 
And now I can come here and I can say enter and look that I can simply keep writing my string. For example, I can say here, dear client, you owe me money. The administration. All right. So as you can see, we have a string that spans into different lines. And I can say here, console write line letter control f5 to run our application and we're going to see that indeed we have to whom it may concern at the administration so we have the whole string being presented here in the console now i was mentioning before that also we can skip some escape sequences when we use a verbatim string literal for example let me say here file directory let's say that this string represents the directory of a file so for example let me say c backlash my documents backlash my folder backlash my file dot x l s x semicolon here now as you can see we have problems here because we need to escape these backlashes so let me do that here let me do that here and let me do that here and as you can see now this is working i can clone this and i can put this here let me comment this out just so that we don't have too many things in the console going on. And as you can see, this works. As you can see, we have this directory, but maybe it is too tedious for us to be escaping every single backlash in our string. Something else that we can do is to use a verbatim string. I can say add here and that's it. This works. I can press Ctrl F5 again. And as you can see, we have our string. Now, I said that with the verbatim string literal, we can skip some escape sequences, but not all of them. For example, let's say here that we want to say the bank says pay us. As you can see here, again, we have the problem of that this is marking the end of the string. So we need to escape this. But in a verbatim string literal, we escape double quotes by using two double quotes. So if I say this and this here, this is a escape sequence that outputs a single double quote. So two double quotes outputs a single double quote. And if I press Ctrl F5, but first let me uncomment this out, Ctrl F5, you are going to see that indeed we have the bank says pay us so as you can see we can use verbatim strings to have strings in several lines and also so that we can skip some escape sequences another kind of a string is raw string literal they help us create strings that are multi-line but also that do not need escape sequences in order to write a raw string literal we do the following let me clean this up a little bit. I don't need this, nor this. I will use the letter later. So let me just comment this out and let's go up here and let's put here our first example of a rostering literal. In order to do a rostering literal, we use at least three double quotes. Let's see that. Let's say string, my first raw string literal, that is what rsl stands for and as i said we use not one not two but three double quotes in order to mark the start of a raw string literal so let me say here hello nice to meet you i am felipe and we can see that if we do console right line my first rsl Control F5 to run our application, we're going to see that indeed we have a normal string. Now, what's different here is that I can, for example, use double quotes without having to escape them. For example, let me say here, nice to meet you, as if it was a lie. And now I can press Control F5 and you are going to see that indeed I didn't have to escape the double quotes in order to use them. Now. I can use a single double quote or I can use two double quotes and there is no problem with that. If I press Ctrl F5 once again, you are going to see that we have here two double quotes. Now, if I want to use three double quotes, then we have a problem because C Sharp thinks that I am ending the rostering literal here, but that's not what I want. I want to have 
three double quotes in the string. In order to fix this, I have to start the row string literal with at least four double quotes. If I do this and I put here four double quotes, then now I can use three double quotes here. Let's see that indeed we can run the application and we have now three double quotes here. Now, besides not having to use escape sequences, and let me just prove that to you right away. Let me put here a backslash and you are going to see that I don't have to do anything special to have a backslash here so that as you can see, we can indeed not have to use escape sequences in raw string literals. Besides that, I can have multi-line raw string literals, for example, and that is why I save this letter. Let's say that I want to have this letter as a raw string literal. For that first, I have to delete this. Then I put here at least three double quotes and then here at least three double quotes. But there is a rule that says that if we are going to have a multi-line row string literal, then the three double quotes have to be on their own line. So I have to say this, I have to do this and then I have to do this. And now we don't have any errors as you may see, because before if I do this, we can see that we have an error because the row string literal delimiter must be on its own line. So let me put this on its own line. And if I uncomment this out, you are going to see that indeed I can print this out in the console. I have my letter here, my letter here. Now, of course, I don't need to have double quotes here, so I can delete this. Something very interesting that I like a lot about rostering literals is that this delimiter that we have here marks the beginning of the text. What do I mean by that? Well, if I do the following, let's say that I want to put this text at the right of this equal sign. Well, if we run our application, we're going to see that we have our text all the way to the right, but maybe I didn't want that. Maybe what I want is to have that text starting here, but that this is the first column of the text. For that, I can use this. I can move this and notice that we have this vertical line. This vertical line is the actual start of the text. So if I say here like this, then this line is saying that this text starts here. So let's see that. Let's press Control F5 one more time. And let's see that again, we have to whom it may concerned at the first column of the text. And as you can see here, although we have this space here, it doesn't count because the text starts at the beginning of this delimiter that we have here. Now that has a consequence and that is that we cannot have text before this delimiter. For example, if I say a space, then now we have an error because this is the first column, but we have text before the beginning and we cannot have that. So we have this error. So what we need to do is to have the text at the very least at the beginning of the delimiter. So as you can see, we can use rostering literals to not have to use escape sequences and also to have multi-line strings. Another data type that we can use is date time, which stores date and time data. For example, I can say date time now equal to, and I can say date time. And I have here a mechanism that allows me to access the current time in my machine, which is date time dot now. With this, I'm storing the current date and time in this variable. So we can do console right line to see that in the console. So let me press control F5 to run our application. And we can see that today is January 29 of the year 23. And this is the current time. All right. Something else that we can do is to choose what date we can represent in a variable. For example, let me say here date time. I'll say first day of the year equal to new day time. We're going to see in the future what this new does, but basically it allows us to create certain values like a new day time. So I'm creating a new day time and I'm going to pass here some data. If I do this, you are going to see that I can press the down key 
and I'm going to be able to see what kind of values I can pass. And one of the 16 options, it says that we can pass year, month, and day. That is what I want. Let me say year 23, month first, and day first. So this is a representation of the date January 1 of the year 2023. Of course, if I come here and I say console right line again, and this time I put first day of the year, control F5 to run our application, what are you going to see that in the second row we have January 1, 2023, and the default time, which is 12 a.m. If you want, you can also pass time data here. For example, I can say, and let me see that I can press the down key and see that I can pass hour, minute, and second. So for example, seven in the morning, minute 15, and second 23. And now if I press Control F5 one more time, what are you going to see that now? We don't have the default time here, but we have 7, 15, and 23 a.m. Also, something that I can do is that I can add time to a date. For example, let me come here and let me say date time tomorrow equal to date time. Now we know that that represents the current time, but I can say add and then as you can see here, we have some functionalities that we can use like at days, at hours, at microseconds, at milliseconds, at minutes, at months, at seconds, etc. In my case, I want to use at days and I want to pass one, which means that I want to take this date and then I want to add one day. So because this is today and I am adding one, then I get back tomorrow. So if I come here and I say console right line, tomorrow, I can see that in the console, just like we had here that today is 29, then tomorrow is the day January 30. Also, we can extract data from a date time. For example, let me come here and let's say console right line, the day is, and let me say that I want to work with this now variable that we have here. I want to say console right line now dot day, I can select a day, also what day of the year is. So let me just copy and paste this here. And then let me say the day of the year is, and then here I will say day of year. Also, as you could just see, we also have the option for day of week. So for example, I can say the day of the week is, and then instead of day of year, I can say day of week. So as you can see, I can extract a lot of data from my day time. Let me comment this out just so that we don't have too much information in the console, control F5. And then as we can see here, we have today's date, but we also have the day 29, the day of the year, which is 29 also because we are in the first month of the year, but I will show you a new example in just a moment. And today is Sunday. So let me close here. So I was telling you that this is a little bit boring because out of the 365 days of the year, January 29 is just the day 29 of the year. So what I'm going to do just for this example is that I want to say here var, let's say August 15, new day time. So year 2023, month August and day 15. Now I will do this again. But for August 15, the day of the year of August 15 is, and now let me put this in here. Now let's see what we get. Control F5, and let's see that the day August 15 as a day of the year is a day 227. So as you can see, we can use date time to represent date and time. We know that we can have variables in C sharp. For example, here we have the age variable whose value is 57. So we can infer from this information that the age of something or someone is 57, and that is fine. Now, it wouldn't make sense for me to say, for example, int first name equal to 57. No one is named 57, so calling an int variable first name 
it's not a good idea because now the name of the variable does not reflect what this variable is supposed to hold. First name equal to 57 doesn't make any sense. So it is better to have meaningful names for our variables. Now, besides this, there are some rules that we have to follow for our code to compile. For example, I can name this variable age and that is fine. I can name this variable uppercase age and that is fine, but I cannot do the following. I cannot say one age. Why? Because there is a rule in C sharp that says that my variables cannot have their first character as a number. The first character of the name of a variable have to be a letter, whether it is a uppercase or lowercase letter, or underscore. This is also acceptable. But what is not acceptable is to have, for example, one here or two here. But you can put a number anywhere else in the name of a variable. For example, I can say h2 and there is no problem with that, h3 and there is no problem with that. I can put a number here and there is no problem with that. Also, I can put as many numbers as I want in the name of a variable, so long as the first character of the name of the variable is uppercase, lowercase letter, or an underscore. Although we have another option, which is to put an at sign here. But another is something that is really cool. If we say console right line, I can put h3 here. So this at is not really part of the name of the variable, but it allows us to write the name of a variable as a reserve keyword from c -sharp. For example, I cannot say here int int 57. Why? Because int is not a valid name for a c -sharp variable because it is a reserve keyword. This is something that already have a meaning in c -sharp and therefore I cannot use it here. But I can do it by doing the following, at int. Now I can have int as the name of my variable. So, so I can come here and say int and now I know that I'm referring to the name of this variable int that we have here. But again, the name of the variable is not at int, but just int. But because int is a reserved keyword in c -sharp, we have to do the following in order to have int as the name of a variable. Now, this is not a good idea. I'm not really recommending you to do this. I'm just saying that you can do it if you want. But again, this is not meaningful. What does it mean that int is equal to 57? It doesn't really make any sense. I prefer to have something like Felipe's age. Now this is a more meaningful name, even more meaningful than just age, because now this tells you what this age is all about. And then we can put this here and it will work. Now, this is called camel case. Camel case is a notation in which we have several words in a name and the first letter of the first word starts with lowercase and the following words start with an uppercase letter. Now, something else you could do is to put an underscore in order to separate different words. That is fine. That is legal in c -sharp. What is not legal is to use a hyphen like this. This is not allowed here in c -sharp. So either use this or use this, whatever you prefer. In my case, I prefer to use this. In order to declare variables, we have always done the following. We say the data type of the variable, then the name of the variable. For example, we have here int Felipe's age or a string last name or daytime now. But you can notice something. When we also initialize the variable in the same line, we can infer what the data type of that variable should be. For example, we are saying here Felipe's age equal to 1999. Now, this is an integer. And because this value is an integer, we can infer from this that the data type of the variable should be integer. The same goes for Gabi Lang. Because this is a string, then we can infer from this value that the data type here should be a string. And also, because daytime now returns a date, it is a daytime, we can know that the data type of this now variable is a daytime. Now, because of this, it is not necessary for me to say daytime, a string, or int. What I can do instead is to use var. Also, here I can use var, and also here I can use var. So when we use var, we are saying that we can infer the data type of a variable by looking at its value. 
In this case, we have here, for example, a date time, and therefore, the data type of this variable is date time. This is called an implicitly typed variable. Now, something that we must know is that we have to initialize the variable in the same line that we are declaring it in order to be able to use var, otherwise it won't work. For example, I can do the following, I can say int h, as you can see, I'm declaring the h variable, but I'm not initializing it in that same line and there is no problem with that. Now, something that I can't do is that I can't put here var. Why is that? Well, because in order for C Sharp to be able to infer the data type of this variable, we have to initialize it in the same line. Otherwise, there is no way for C Sharp to know that the data type of this H variable is an integer. We must initialize it, we must assign a value to it in order for C Sharp to know that this is a int variable. So this is one limitation that var has. So if you can initialize the variable in the same line, you can use var. But if, as in this case, you cannot do that for some reason, then you are obligated to use the data type explicitly. We know we can assign values to variables. For example, I can say int h equal to 999 semicolon here, and that is fine. But sometimes I want to give a neutral value to a variable. A value that we can use is the default value for that data type. For that, I can do the following. I can say default semicolon. And with this, I am assigning the default value of the int data type to the age variable. What is the default value of the int data type? Well, let's see that. Let's come here and let's say console red line default value of int semicolon console right line h semicolon control f5 to run our application and we can see here that the default value of int is zero and then after that nothing stops me from assigning a different value to the h variable for example i can say h equal to eight and there is no problem with that also besides doing it like this i can do default int in order to be more specific about from what data type I want to get the default value. This is useful if for some reason you want to use an implicitly typed variable here, because here I'm saying that this is the default value of integer and therefore this is an integer. But I cannot use the previous nomenclature, which is just saying default, because then there is no way for the c compiler to know of what data type we want the default value. So if we want to use var, we have to use default int. Or, if I use int here, then I can just do default here. Now, as you may imagine, other data types have other default values. Let's see the default values of other data types. For example, let me say console write line default value of bool. And then I'm going to do the following. I'm going to put here default bool. And then let me do the same for other data types like decimal, let me say decimal and decimal here. And then after that, I will do the same for date time. So date time and date time here. And finally, let's do the same for a string. So a string here and a string here. All right, so let's see what we get. Control F5 to run our application. And as you can see here, we have default value of int, zero, default value of bool, false, default value of decimal, zero also, default value of date time, the first of January of the year one. This is not 2001, this is the year one. And then default value of a string, nothing. What is going on here? Why do we have nothing here? So far, we have seen that we can assign all kinds of values to our variables, integers, real numbers, booleans, text, and even date and time. However, not all data types are the same. Data types in C Sharp can be classified in two ways. There are value types and there are reference types. Value types are those that store their content in a place in memory called a stack. Basically, the value of the variable is stored on the stack. 
Reference types, on the other hand, store a reference to a place in memory that is where the value is found. This place in memory is called the heap. An analogy to understand reference types is to analyze the difference between the address of a house and the house itself. In this sense, if I give you a paper with the address of my house, 742 Evergreen Terrace, you understand that the paper does not literally contain my house, but is a reference to the place where the house is located. Well, something similar happens with reference type variables, which do not store the value itself, but the address where the value is located. This may seem like a minor thing, but it is essential when working with variables in C -sharp. One consequence of this is that value type variables always have a value, of course, because they store the value in themselves, and therefore, to create them, you need a value in the first place. However, reference types are different, since they do not store a value themselves, but a reference to a value. Well, something that is possible is that a reference type does not contain any reference. Going back to the analogy of my home address, it's like I hand you a blank piece of paper. That piece of paper does not contain a reference to anything. In the case of reference types, this is expressed with null. That is, when a variable is equal to null, that means two things, that the variable is a reference type, and also that it does not contain a reference pointing to some value on the heap. In the previous video, we saw that the default value of a string data type was nothing. This nothing is actually null, and therefore, a string is a reference type. For value types, some examples are int, decimal, float, double, bool, and daytime. These types cannot be assigned null, since nulls means no reference and value types do not hold references. So let's go back to Visual Studio and see this. As you can see here, we have the code of the previous video, and if we press Ctrl F5, we're going to see that indeed, after default value of string, we have nothing, and we just learned that that nothing is null. And we also learned that we can't assign null to value types. For example, int is a value type, so if I say here null, we will get an error because we cannot assign null to a value type. The same goes for, for example, a bool. If I say here, bool today is Sunday, I cannot say null, because again, this is a value type. Now, let me delete this, and I will leave this here just for a moment. Let me put here a string, first name, as we know, a string is a reference type, and therefore, I can assign null to it, right? Well, for some weird reason, I'm getting a warning here. Now, notice, here we have an error. This is an error, and this is a warning, so they are different. But why am I getting a warning here? I should be able to assign null to a string variable because a string is a reference type, and therefore it can be null. Well, if we read the warning, we're going to see that it says converting null literal or possible null value to non-nullable type. Non-nullable type? What does that mean? This should be nullable. This should be something that I can assign null to it. What is going on here? In this video, we're going to talk about nullable and non-nullable reference types. Let's start with nullables. As you know, we have value types and reference types in C -sharp. We can convert a value type to a reference type with the use of nullables. The idea is that we can convert a value type to a reference type so that it can hold a null by using this. If I come here and instead of int, I say int and question mark. Now, as you can see here, I'm allowed to assign null to this. Why is that? Well, because now this h variable can hold either an int or null. So I can say h equal to null or, for example, h equal to 78, and there is no problem with that. The idea is that now I have extended the capabilities of my integer so that now it can be assigned null. So let me put null back here. 
And now let's talk about this warning that we have here. If we hover over this warning, we're going to see that we have converting null literal or possible null value to non-nullable reference type. So the thing is that in recent versions of C Sharp, we have non-nullable reference types, which are reference types that we don't expect to hold a null value. The reason for this is that if you have a variable like first name and its value is null, then if you try to access the members of that variable, you are going to get an error. Let's see an example of that. Let me delete all of this and let's do the following. Let me say console write line and I want to say first name to upper. We know that the to upper functionality allows us to have a string in uppercase. And from here, you can see that we have a warning here that says the reference of a possible null reference, which basically means that we're being warned that this value may be null. And why are they warning us about that? Because we will get an error. Let's see that. Let me press Ctrl F5 to run our application. And we're going to see here that we have this error. It says unhandled exception. In .NET, an exception is just an error. It says system dot null reference exception. Object reference not set to an instance of an object. When you get this error, it means that you were trying to access a member of something that was null. So here we have a string first name, right? And then we say first name dot to upper. This is a member of the string class, as we saw before. We're going to talk more about classes in the future, but we know that if we use the dot operator, we can access functionality and we can also access data of this variable and these are called members. So I'm accessing the to upper member of a string, but because this is null, we are basically trying to say that we want to have the representation of null in uppercase, which doesn't make any sense because as you know, null is nothing. So you cannot have the uppercase of nothing, which is why we get an error. So this is what we're getting warned about. We're being said that we may be accessing the members of a null reference. So as you can see, it is really dangerous to have null in variables. That is why, as we said in recent versions of C-sharp, we have non-nullable reference types activated by default, which means that it is not expected that this variable, although it is a reference type, will have null. We have to be explicit about the fact that a variable may contain null, and we do that by marking it as nullable. Now we don't have this warning here, because we're indicating that it may be possible that this variable has a null value. Although we still have this warning here because of course this could be null. And we're going to learn how to code in a way that we don't get these errors. But for now we're going to ignore this and let me just teach you how to deactivate non-nullable reference types just in case you don't want to use them. So if you don't want to have to be explicit about the fact that a reference type may hold a null value, you can just deactivate non-nullable reference types. So let's do the following. Let me delete this. As you can see here, we have the warning again. And in order for me to deactivate non-nullable reference types, in order to do that, we do the following. Let's go to the solution explorer, double click on variables. And here we have our csproj file open. And here we have nullable. And it says enable, so I can say disable. And if I save, and come back to program, we are going to see that this warning here and this warning here disappear. They disappear because we are deactivating that help that we get that we may be accessing a nullable value. Now, this does not make the error disappear. If I press Ctrl F5 to run my application one more time, we are going to see that we get back the error. Why is that? Well, because what we did was to deactivate the warning, but we still have the root cause of our error, which is that we are trying to access a member of a variable that holds null. Now, of course, if I say here, first name equal to Felipe, then there is no problem with this because now, since this is not null, by the time it reaches this line, then in the console, we only have Felipe, so we don't have any null reference exception. But if I remove this, then we are back at square one and we have the error again. So 
it is recommended to leave non-nullable reference types activated because that way you get warnings about where you may have an error in your code. For example, that this may throw an exception because you are trying to access a possible null value. And this obligates you to code in a safe manner. Or you will have to ignore the warnings like this one. If I don't want to have the warning, then I can put this and be clear that this value may contain null. And then in the future, as I said before, we are going to learn techniques to avoid having this error here. So for example, I can say that if this is null, then I don't want to access this member. But again, that is something that we're going to see in the future. For now, let's just move on. Expressions are operations we can perform in values or variables. Usually, we get a new value from an expression. One example is addition. So let me say here, var num1 equal to 7 and var num2 equal to 4 and now we can add num1 and num2 together. We can say var sum equal to num1 plus num2. This is an example of an expression. Specifically, this is a binary expression because we have two values. We have the value num1 and the value num2. So as you can see, we are basically adding variables here. I don't really need to have variables in order to have a binary operation. For example, I can say var sum2 and I can directly say 7 plus 4 and it is exactly the same. But as you know, in this case, since we are using variables, if I need to use this variable in several places, it is better to have it in a variable and also because now it is in a variable, I can give it a meaningful name so that this formula may make more sense than if I just sum seven and four without any context. Of course, as you may imagine, I'm not limited to only adding numbers, I can subtract them. For example, I can say here, bar subtract equal to num1 minus num2, and this is another binary expression. I can also multiply, so I can say product equal to num1 times num2, semicolon here. I can also do division, so I can divide, division, I can say num1 divided by num2. Another operation is the reminder operation, so we can say num1 reminder, and we use this percentage sign for that operation, num2, semicolon here. Now, of course, we can show on the screen the result of these different expressions. So let me say console right line, the sum is console right line and sum. And let me do the same for the other values. And there we go. Now let me press Ctrl F5 to run our application and we're going to see that we have the different results of the operations. Let me put this here so that you can see that we have the sum of seven and four is 11, the subtraction of seven minus four is three, the product of seven and four is 28, the division is one. That is not correct. Why do we have a one here? Well, the reason for that is that we have here an integer and here another integer and the division of two integers is another integer. That is why we are getting the result truncated. So what can we do about it? Well, one thing that we could do is to transform one of the values into a double so that we can have a double divided by an integer, for example, and the result will be a double and so it will have the decimal values. But how do we make that transformation? Well, in the future, we are going to study something that is called casting, which allows us to change the data type of one variable to another. So in this case, what we're going to do is that we're going to change the data type of num1 to double. And this is how we do casting. We use a parenthesis before the variable. And with this, we are basically changing the data type from num1 to double and therefore we have 
a double divided by an integer and the result will be a double as you can see here. So let me press Ctrl F5 one more time and now we have the division is 1.75 which is the correct value. And finally we have the remainder is 3 because if we divide 7 with 4 the remainder is 3. In the previous video we saw that we can use the plus sign to add two numbers. Now that is the case when we have a binary expression like this one that has two numbers, number one here and number two here. But what happens if instead of having numbers, we have strings? Let's see that. For example, let me say that I have bar name or first name Felipe, then bar last name equal to Gavilan, then what is the result of adding them together? What is the result of me putting here a binary expression again with the plus sign, but instead of having numbers, I now have strings? Well, the result of this will be the concatenation of the strings. That is that we're going to have here Felipe Gavilan, like this. Felipe Gavilan in this way. This is a concatenation and there is something very important here that we're going to revise later in the course and that is that we can have an operator, this is called an operator, we can have an operator like the plus sign and for numbers it is going to do one thing and for strings it is going to do another thing. This is called an overloaded operator which means that depending on the data types that participate in the binary expression, we are going to get one behavior or the other. Let's see that. Let me see that I can put here console right line. Let me put result on the screen so that you can see that indeed we have first name and last name concatenated. As you can see here, we have Felipe Gavilan. Of course, there is no space between them because I didn't put a space here. If I put a space here, then we are going to have a space in the concatenation here. Now, this is cool because now we don't need to use two lines to express the result of a variable. For example, instead of me saying console right line, the sum is, and then another line, I can concatenate this and say plus sum. Now, here we have a string plus a number. And in C-sharp, what happens here is that this number is going to be casted to a string. Remember that we said that casting means changing the data type of a variable. In this case, this will be changed to a string and therefore we are going to have a concatenation here. If I press Ctrl F5, we are going to see that indeed we have the sum is 11. The sum of 7 and 4 is 11. And therefore, as you can see, we have operators like plus that depending on the data types that are involved in the binary expression we are going to get either a sum in this case or a concatenation in this other case. In the future we are going to see that we can define our own behaviors for the plus sign but again that is in the future. For now let's just move on. We know we can do a lot of binary expressions using integers. But what happens when we use real numbers, like for example decimal? Let's say that I'll come here and put 7.1 and remember that in order to use decimal we use an M suffix. And then in here I can do the same, let me put 3.5 M and in here we have an error because I cannot divide a double and a decimal, I don't really need this anymore, this casting anymore. We had that because we were dividing into integers and we wanted to have a real number as a result. So now let's see what we get here. Control F5 and we're going to see that we have the sum of these two numbers is this, the subtraction is this, the product, the division and the remainder. This all seems fine and please keep in mind these numbers. Like for example 3.6, we're going to see that if we change this from decimal, for example, to double, we are going to see something different. Let's come here and let's see that now that we have two doubles, 
we have the sum is 10.6, that is fine, but the subtraction is 3.5999 all the way to a 6 at the end. The same goes for the product, we have 24.84.999, and then here the remainder, which was 0 0.1 if you remember, now we have 0 0.0999, 64 at the end. What is this? Well, if you remember, we said in the past that a good use case for the decimal data type is for applications that deal with money. Why is that? Well, because internally, decimal uses a base 10 representation for dealing with numbers. Base 10 is the same base that we use in real life. That is, numbers go from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then all the way to 10, then 11, 12, 13, all the way to 20, and so on. So that is base 10. On the other hand, float and double do not use internally base 10, they use base 2. And although you can come here, this is double, right? And although you can come here and say 2, and of course you can represent this exactly using base 2, sadly you cannot represent this in an exact manner using base 2. The best you can hope is for an approximation. And now there is a problem with that, and that is that if you have too many approximations, at some point, you are going to get really far away from the real value, because an approximation is not a real thing, of course, that is why it is an approximation. So in double, we will have an approximation of this, then an approximation of this, and then when we subtract them together, we are going to get another approximation to the real value, and that is why here we don't get 3.6 but 3.599999 because it is an approximation. Again, this is why when we deal with applications that use, and let me close this, when we deal with applications that use money, like a bank application or a loan application, we are expected to use decimal because internally they use a base 10 representation for numbers. And so we're going to get expected results like this one. So I just wanted to mention that, yes, we can use real numbers in binary expressions, but we have to be careful because in some applications we could get unacceptable rounding errors. We know we can add numbers, and also we know that there is a maximum value for integers. What happens if we add 1 to this maximum value? Let's see. Let's say here bar maximum equal to int dot max value, which is the max value of integers, and then I'm going to say var sum equal to maximum plus one. And let's see what we get. Let me say console right line, and we're going to say max maximum, and then console right line, sum, sum. All right, so control F5 to run our application. And let's see that here we have a really, really, really weird result. We have max, which is about 2 billion, and then we have this 2 billion plus 1 minus 2 billion. What is going on here? This doesn't make any sense. What's going on here is that we have what is known as a arithmetic overflow, because this is the limit of integers. When we add 1, what it does is that it goes back to the smallest possible value, which is this. If we come here, let me do the following so that you can see. If we come here and we say min, let me put here int min value, this is the minimum value of integers, let's see that they coincide. Because as we said, this is the maximum value, and if I add one, then it goes all the way back to the smallest value. It's just like a clock. After the second 59, it goes back to second zero. But what if I don't want this? What if I don't want to have it so that my numbers work in this almost unpredictable manner? Well, what I can do is that I can use checked. With check, I can make sure that I don't go above the maximum value or below the minimum value. Let's see that. Let me use here checked and then parentheses. And what I'm saying is that I want to make sure that there is no an arithmetic overflow in this operation. Now if I press Ctrl F5 to run my application, we are going to see that we have 
overflow exception. We learned before that an exception is just an error. So we have here that the application is telling us that our arithmetic operation resulted in an overflow. And therefore, our application stopped working. But what is important here is that now we know that indeed we have an arithmetic overflow. Also, let me press enter. Also, another way that we can indicate that we want to check for arithmetic overflows is using a block of code. So let me do the following. Let me remove this. Let's say that I have several operations and they all are contained within a block of code like this one. So let me do this. Let me do this. And now here I can come here and say checked. Now this checked applies to this whole block of code. So it applies here and it applies in whatever other binary expression that I have. And that is great because now I don't have to write check on each individual operation because if we have minimum, minimum equal to int min value, semicolon, bar subtract equal to minimum, minimum minus one, then this would also cause an overflow and because of this, we're going to get an exception either here or here. We saw that we can use the plus operator to concatenate strings. For example, here we have first name and last name and they are being concatenated. Now, remember that before when we didn't have this space here, we had Felipe Gavilan without any space between those names. Now, this is not what we wanted. What we wanted was to have, yes, a concatenation, but a space between those names. A technique that we can use to make it more obvious that this is going to happen is a string interpolation. A string interpolation allows us to concatenate strings in what I would describe as a more natural manner. For example, here we have first name and last name. Let me delete this and I will put a dollar sign and then quotation marks. This dollar sign allows me to use a string interpolation. And basically what a string interpolation does is that it allows me to put here the variables. For example, I can use this curly brackets and then in here I can say first name and then a space and then here last name. So as you can see here, what we are doing is that we have a string that is composed of these two values, first name and last name. And look how obvious it is that now we have a space between those values. So what we have here is Felipe Gavilan. So let's see that here at the bottom, we have that we're printing this result variable. So let's press Control F5 to run our application. And let's see that indeed we have Felipe Gavilan with an a space between Felipe and Gavilan. And we can do the same for the sum is 11. We can come here and we can say a string interpolation. And instead of using this plus operator, we can delete this and we can say here sum. And it is exactly the same. We will have the sum is 11 because we have this string being concatenated with this value. But again, what I like about the string interpolation is that it looks easy in my eye to understand what is going on without all of those plus signs in the way. So let me press Ctrl F5 just to show you that indeed we have the sum is 11. So as you can see, we can use a string interpolation to concatenate strings in a very easy manner. We saw several binary expressions and those are expressions that have two values. Now we're going to see ordinary expressions. As you may guess, ordinary expressions are expressions that only have one value. As you can see here, we have the number seven. One example of an ordinary operation is to put a minus before a number. For example, let me say num1 multiplied by minus one equal to minus num1. This is equivalent to saying minus one times num one. As you can see here, we have the minus operator and because it is only affecting one value, it is an ordinary expression. We can see that indeed we have minus seven. So let me say right line num one multiply by minus one semicolon here. 
Control F5. And let's see that indeed we have minus seven. Of course, if we have minus seven here, then minus seven times minus one, it is positive seven or just seven. So if we press Control F5 one more time, we're going to see that indeed we have seven, positive seven. So let me close this and now let me put this back as it was and let's continue. Another honorary expression, which is very famous and that you're probably going to use a lot in your life is the plus plus. So num one plus plus. What is this? Let me comment this out. What is this? This is just a shorthand for num one equal to num one plus one. So we are adding one to num one. Let's see that. Console, right line, num one. So this should be eight, right? And of course, it is eight. It is eight because this means just adding one to this num one variable. So let me close this and let's see that just like we have plus plus, we have minus minus. So let me comment this out. Num one minus minus. And as you may guess, minus minus is just a shorthand for num one minus one. And then we can see that we're going to have six. As you can see here, we have six. Now, something that you may see also is to have, instead of, for example, num one plus plus is to have plus plus num one. This is again, the same as this. It is not exactly the same, but the value is going to be the same. For example, this is going to be eight. Let's see that quickly that we have eight and the same goes for, let me copy this and paste it here. Let me remove this and just put this at the front and let me comment this out. And you're going to see that indeed minus minus num one is going to be this. So we're going to have a six in the console, as you can see here. Now, I just said that they produce the same value, but they are not exactly the same. So what is the difference? The difference is the following, let me, comment this out and let's do the following. Remember that this is seven, right? What happens if I say num one plus plus here? What is going to happen first? Is seven going to be printed in the console and then num one will get its value change or is num one first going to get its value change and then we're going to get eight in the console? Let's see. Let me press Control F5 to run our application and we're going to see that we have seven. We have seven, but that is not the end of the story because if I come here and I say console right line num one, we're going to see that indeed what we have is that we have seven first and then eight. So what is going on here is that if we have num one plus plus, we first evaluate console right line with the original value of num1 and then after that, we edit the value of num1. And we know that because after this line, num1 is equal to eight. Now, what if we do the following? What if I say plus plus num1? Well, now it is different because since this is first, what is going to happen first is that we're going to edit the value of num1, so it will be eight, and then after that is that we're going to have eight printed in the console. So we're going to have eight printed in the console twice. Let's see that. Control F5 to run our application, and indeed we have eight, eight. What does this mean? Well, this means that although plus plus num1 and num1 plus plus produces the same value, the difference is that if we have an expression like console right line plus plus num1, then first the value of num1 is going to get updated and then the expression is going to get evaluated. And if we have num1 plus plus, then first we're going to do the whole expression and then after that is that we're going to edit the num1 variable. Another way of seeing this is that, and it is the one that I use mentally to remember this is that if we have plus plus first, it means that we want to add one first. And if we have it after, then it means that we want to edit the variable after. The same principle goes for minus minus. Now, if it is confusing for you, then just don't do it. Instead of doing console right line num plus plus or plus plus num one, just do the following. Just say 
num1 plus plus, and then here num1, and it will be more clear that first you want to edit the value of num1 and then to print it out, or vice versa, first you want to print the value of num1 and then edit the value. We know that a binary expression, like adding two numbers, returns another number. For example, we have num1 here and num2 here, and if I say sum equal to num1 plus num2, we have that the result is another integer, because these two are integers, and its value is 12. That is great, that is fine, we understand that. Now, not every expression whether it is binary, onary, or whatever, is going to return a value. We call those expressions void. A void expression does not return anything. An example of a void expression is the right line functionality. So if we say console right line, whatever I want, if we hover over right line, we're going to see that we have here void. What is void? Void basically means that nothing is being returned from this functionality. Here, we are being returned an integer, but here, we are not being returned anything. So if I try, let me say something, let me say var value equal to, this does not compile because we cannot assign nothing to value. If we hover over here, we can see that we cannot assign void to an implicitly typed variable. So we cannot assign void to this value variable. And something else that we could try to do is that, okay, do not store it in a variable, but add one to this void. But again, we cannot have that because we cannot add a void and an int. We cannot add nothing and then an int. We cannot do that. So there is really not much we can do with void, but it is useful because it allows us to express that a piece of functionality does not return anything. When I say return, I mean that there is not an output value of this functionality. Just like we have an output value of this binary expression, we don't have an output value for this right line. And just like right line, in the future, we will write our own pieces of functionality that are going to do something, but that are not going to output anything. In this video, we're going to talk about the assignment operator. We know that we can assign values to a variable by using the equal sign. So this is the assignment operator. We also know that we can add, for example, two numbers together. Like I can say bar sum equal to num1 plus num2. And this is the plus operator. There is a way in which we can combine the assignment operator and the plus operator. And that is by using the addition assignment operator or just plus assignment operator. That is, we can do the following. We can say num1 plus equal num2. So what is this? Here, what we're doing is that we're saying 7 plus 5 equal to 12. Okay, and we're assigning that 12 into the sum variable, right? Well, here, what we're doing is that we're saying num1 is equal to num1 plus num2. So we're saying 7 plus 5 equal to 12. But this 12 is being assigned to our num1 variable. So if we come here and we say console right line num1 we're going to see that and let me put this also here let me just copy and paste it here we're going to see that before this line num1 is equal to 7 and after this line num1 is going to be equal to 12. right click control f5 to run our application and we're going to see that indeed we have 7 and 12. So what this addition assignment operator does is that it is a shorthand for saying num1 equal to num1 itself plus num2, which is this variable that we're putting here. And we have equivalent operators for the other arithmetic operators. Like for example, we can say num1 minus equal num2, and this is just num1 equal to num1 minus num2. 
which is 7 minus 5 equal to 2. If we comment this out, we're going to see that indeed we have 7 and 2. Again, the same can be done for multiplication, division, and reminder. That is, we can say num1 times equal num2, and this is just, and let me put a semicolon here, this is just num1, num1 times num2, the same goes for num1 divided equal num2, num1, num1, num2, and finally num1 reminder equal num2, num1 equal to num1 remainder num2. And we can do the same for strings. For example, we know that the plus operator for strings means concatenation, right? So if I say here, let me put this below this num1. Let me say bar first name equal to Felipe. And then last name here, Gavilan. And I'm going to say first name plus equal last name. What we're doing here is that we're saying that first name now it's equal to first name plus last name. So it is going to be Felipe Gavilan, like this. All right, so let me see, console right line, and first name, it is indeed going to be equal to Felipe Gavilan, as we can see here. So it is important to note that there is a very clear difference between, for example, Barasom, equal to num1 plus num2, and that is that num1 is not being edited. Num1 is not being updated here, but in here it is. So therefore, if you don't want to modify, in this case, num1, then you can do it like this. But if you want to modify num1, then you can use this operator that we have here, the plus equal operator. In this video, we are going to see the operator precedence in C Sharp. The idea is that we may have a complicated expression that involves several operators, and so we need to know in what order are those operations going to happen. For example, let me say here, var num4, we have of course here three numbers, and let me say that I have the following, I have num1 plus num2 plus num3. Now. This is actually really simple because this is just one plus two plus three. And it doesn't matter if we say one plus two, three, and then three plus three, six, or two plus three, five, then one plus five, six, it is the same result. So here it doesn't really matter the order of the operations, but if we say var num five, num one plus num two, times num3, then here we have a problem. Because it is not the same for me to say, for example, let me put here one plus two times three. Let's say that I think that this is going to be one plus two, three times three, nine. Now this is incorrect. Let me just put here incorrect, by the way, just in case you think that this is the correct interpretation, it is not. The right way is to do 1 plus 2 times 3 is going to be equal to 1 plus 6 because 2 times 3 is 6 and then 7. This is correct. Now, why is this? Well, because multiplication is done first. So we have here this multiplication and it is going to take precedence over this sum that we have here and therefore we are going to have 2 times 3 equal to 6, and then plus 1 equal to 7. And I can prove that to you right away, console right line, just in case you don't believe me. Num5, console F5 to run our application, and we're going to see that indeed we have 7. So again, this is incorrect. So let me even delete it, just in case it is confusing. So this is the right way of seeing it. Now, what if I wanted to actually do the sum first. Well, for that we have parentheses. For example, we can say here var num6 equal to 
parentheses num1 plus num2 times num3. Now, because I'm using parentheses, I'm indicating that I want to do this operation first, and therefore, this is going to be equal to 9. Now, if this is confusing for you anyway, I have a better solution. Just don't use complicated expressions like this one. For example, if you know that you must add two numbers and then multiply it by a third number, just do the following. Just say var num7 equal to num1 plus num2 and then var num8 equal to num7 times num3. Now, in this way, it is not confusing. It is not confusing anymore. Because now, by using several lines, by expanding our operations in several lines, by expanding our operations into several lines, then now it is way more clear that what we wanted to do was to add the numbers first and then do the multiplication. So again, if you have issues with operations like this because they are complicated, then just don't use them. And you can do something like this. Now, of course, maybe one of your colleagues is going to write code like this. So it is good that you understand what is going on and how to interpret this operation or this other operation. But if you want to make your code more readable for you in the future, just do it like this and you will be fine. In this video, we are going to talk about constants. In the past, we have seen that we can create variables and the idea of a variable is that its value can change. For example, here we have num1 equals 1. Now I can say num1 equal to 2 and there is no problem with that. So its value can change. But what if we don't want that? What if I want to have a value that after initializing it, we don't want the value to be able to change? For that, we can declare a constant. For example, I can say const int my constant equal to 7, for example. Now, this 7 is forever. After this line of code, I cannot change the value of my constant. For example, I can't say my constant equal to 9, for example, I can't do this. I can't do this because since it was declared as a constant, then we cannot change its value. Of course, I can use its value. For example, I can say console write line and I can print my constant in the console. There is no problem with that. I can use the constant, but I cannot change its value. Now, why would we want this? Why would we want to have a constant? Well, for example, there are values for example, in mathematics or physics, engineering, that are constants and therefore we shouldn't be allowed to change them. That is, for example, the case of pi. If we say math, there is a math class that has math functionality and in here we have pi. And as you may guess, we have pi here and if you see here it says const because it is a constant. Of course, because pi is a mathematical constant and therefore, so that people are not allowed to change it, they declare it as a const, as a constant. Something else that we can do is to avoid having magic numbers. What is a magic number? A magic number is a number that appears in an expression but we do not know what it does. For example, let me put this here and let's come here and let me say bar a speed 100 bar a speed 2 equal to a speed divided by 3.6. Honestly, it is really hard to tell what is going on here. So we have an speed and then we have another speed and then we have this 3.6 here, which we don't know what it is. This is known as a magic number. We say that it is magical because it's just there. It works, but we don't know what it is about. It would be better, since this is a constant value, to put it in a constant so that we can give it a name. For example, I can come here and say const double conversion factor kilometers per hour to meters per second equal to 
3.6. Now we know that this number is just a conversion factor that allows us to convert from kilometers per hour to meters per second. So this means that this speed is just a speed in kilometers per hour and this second speed is just a conversion is just a conversion to meters per second. So as you can see, and let me put a semicolon here. So as you can see, instead of having a magic number here, which we don't know anything about, we were able to give it a name using a constant. Of course, this could be a variable, but in our case, it doesn't make sense because this is a constant in physics. So we don't really want to be able to change its value. Therefore, it makes sense to make it a constant. So as you can see, we can use constants if we have values that will not be able to change and also to avoid having magic numbers. We can also use constants for strings. For example, const a string my value equal to Felipe. And then now I can't change my value to anything else. Again, this works. I cannot change it. So far in the course, we have seen that when we create a variable or a constant and we don't use them, we get a warning. We get a warning that says that the variable non one is assigned, but its value is never used. Of course, this means that you have a variable that's not being used and it would be better to not have it. But maybe you have a good reason, for example, to have this variable here. And you also don't want to have this warning in the way. So something that you can do is to suppress warnings. For example, I can say control dot and then I can say suppress or configure issues and then come to suppress CS0219, which is the code for the warning that refers to unused variables. If I press enter here, then we get this preprocessor directive, which basically what it does is to give a special instructions to the C-sharp compiler so that we tell it, in this case, that a warning will be disabled and that is the warning CS0219, which is this warning that we have here. Of course, this disabling will only go from here to here. So from line one to line three, in this case, it only applies to line two, which is the only one that has code. And by that, I mean C-sharp code, not this preprocessor directive code. As you can see, it doesn't apply to this constant that I have here. But if I want to apply it also to my constant, then I just need to move this below the constant. And therefore, as you can see, we're from here disabling this warning and then here we're restoring this warning. So whatever is below this line of code will have this warning applied. Now, it is not always a good idea to be ignoring warnings because they have a reason to be there. In this case, we have a variable that is on the way and that maybe we should delete it because it is not being used. Now, if you want to be really severe about how you treat your warnings, you can make them errors. Because if you remember in a previous class, I said that even if you have a warning, you can run your application. For example, let me say here, console write line, the end, control F5. We're going to see that indeed my application ran without any issues. Warnings do not impede your application from running. But what if you want to treat a warning like an error? Well, for that, you can say control dot here, suppress or configure issues, configure CS0219 severity, and I can say error. Now I can mark it as an error. And with this, as you can see here, this squiggly line changed from green to red, which means that now I cannot even compile my application. If I try to press Ctrl F5 one more time, we're going to see that we have there were build errors. Would you like to continue and run the last successful build? If I say yes, what is going to happen is that my application will run the last version, the previous version, of the application that was successfully built. For example, let's see something. Let me come here and let's say, for example, the N2. So I change this to the N2. And if I say Control F5 and I say, yes, I want to run the last successful build. Yes, we're going to get here the end without the two. Why is that? Well, because the last time we're able to build this application, 
this string here was the end. Now it is the end too, but we haven't been able to build the application because we have this error here. So let me close this, let me close this. And if you want to revert this back and make it a warning and not an error, you can come here, configure CS0219 severity and make it back as a warning. And then this will change to green after a few seconds. And there you go, as you can see, it is green. Therefore, now it is just a warning and not an error. And therefore, I can run my application, as you can see here. Top level statements allow you to have files that don't have to go through so much ceremony to do something. Only one top level statement file is allowed per program. This file represents the entry point of the application. In C Sharp, each statement ends with a semicolon. Ideally, we should place one statement per line to make our code more readable. Variables allow us to have data in memory, such as numbers, text, dates, among others. Data types allow us to indicate the nature of data, that is, if it is a number, a date, text, etc. Sometimes we can skip having to be naming the data type of a variable by using bar. We call this implicitly typed variable. Value types is when the data is stored in the variable itself. Meanwhile, reference type is when the variable holds a reference to the value but not the value itself. A reference type variable may not store any reference, which is expressed using null. We can use nullables to make a value type become a reference type that can contain null. By default, new C Sharp applications come with the non nullable reference types feature, which means that we have to be explicit when indicating when a reference type can contain null. This helps us avoid having unexpected problems at runtime. Expressions allow us to perform operations on the data we have in our application. So, for example, we can add variables. Constants allow us to define values which do not change. This is useful for when we need to give a value a name, like pi, which is approximately 3.14, but we don't want that value to be able to change in the future. Hello, my name is Felipe Gavilan, and in this module, we are going to talk about conditions and iterations. With these tools, we'll be able to add more logic to our code. We will be able to decide whether to execute one part of our code or another based on the result of a Boolean expression. And not only that, but we will learn to execute the same statement repeatedly using iterations. So let's get started. Let's create a project for this module. Let's go to create a new project in Visual Studio, console app, I'll call it conditions and iterations or loops, next, .NET 7, create. All right, so let's begin. There is an operator that allows us to go from true to false or from false to true. And that is the honorary logical negation operator or just the negation operator. As we said, it basically allows us to go from true to false or from false to true. This is useful if, for example, you need to flip a Boolean from one value to the other value. For example, here we have that today Sunday is equal to true. Therefore, this is a Boolean variable, right? But what if I want to flip its value? Well, one way is by using the logical negation. For example, I can say today is Sunday equal to negation operator today is Sunday. So now because this is true, this here is true, but when you negate true, you get false. And therefore, now the value of this variable is changed to false. And therefore, here we will have false. Let's press Ctrl F5 to see that. As you can see here, we have false. Now, of course, as we said, if we start with false, then we have here false, but the negation of false is true, and therefore now this value is equal to true, and therefore we are going to have true in the console. We can run our application and see that indeed we have true. So as you can see, when you have a Boolean value, you can negate it 
with the negation operator and you're going to get the opposite value. The first thing that we're going to see is Boolean logic. The idea of Boolean logic or Boolean expression is an expression that is going to return a Boolean that is true or false. Remember that in the previous module, we saw that we have Boolean variables like today is Sunday and I can say this is equal to true or maybe it is equal to false. So we have true or false as the values of a Boolean variable. So what we're saying is that we're going to have an expression and the result of that expression is going to be a Boolean. Let's see an example. Let's say that we have a num1 equal to 5 and a num2 equal to 5. I want to ask a question. Are these two values the same? Of course they are. We can see it with our own eyes. But how do I express that in C-sharp code? Well, for that we have the equality operator and its symbol is equal equal. So let's see that. Let's come here and say bar is num1 equal to num2. And the value of this variable is going to be num1 equality operator num2. So here I'm asking if these two values are the same. In this case, this is 5 and this is 5 and therefore we expect this to be true. Again, this is a Boolean expression. It is an expression that returns a Boolean, either true or false. Now let's come here and let's say console right line. I'll use a string interpolation and I will say is num1 equal to num2 and then here I will put the Boolean. All right, so let's press control F5 to run our application. And we're going to see that we have is 5 equal to 5. Of course, true. Now, if I close this and I say 6, then now we expect this to be false. Control F5 just to check that. Is 5 equal to 6? False. All right, so this is good. Now, besides asking if two values are the same, we can ask if two values are different. For example, I can say bar is num1 different from num2. And that is expressed with the following operator, exclamation mark equal num2. So what do we have here? We have here the inequality operator, which as its name implies, verifies if two values are different. So if they are different, it returns true. If they are the same, it returns false. So in this case, since we have a 5 here and a 6 here, this is going to return true. Let's see that. Let me say, I will just copy this, is different from, and then in here I will paste this. Control F5 and let's see that we have, is 5 different from 6? True, of course they are different. And if I put here 5, Let's press Ctrl F5 and we're going to see that we have here, is 5 different from 5? Of course not, that is false. Now it is important to realize that when we have one equal, we have the assignment operator. This is an assignment. And when we have two equals, what we have is the equality operator. Here we're assigning a value to a variable and here we are asking a question, are these two values the same? So it is important to realize that when we have one, it is an assignment, and when we have two, it is the equality operator. And this is the inequality operator. We can see these Boolean expressions as asking questions about values in our code. As we can see, we can ask if two values are the same or if two values are different. But there are other kind of questions that we can ask. For example, is this value greater than this other value? Let's see. Let me delete this. Let me also delete this. And let me put here a 6. All right, so we have num1 equal to 5 and num2 equal to 6. And also let me delete this. So we have these two values and I want to know if num2 is greater than num1. Again, with our own eyes, we can see that that is true. But how do I ask that in C-sharp code? 
Well, for that we can use some mathematical symbols that we learned in high school. For example, I can say bar is num2 greater than num1 equal to assignment. And now I'm going to ask the question num2 greater than num1, semicolon here. So we have here that we're asking is num2 greater than, this is the greater than symbol, is it greater than num1? In our case, of course, this is true. So I can say here, console right line, string interpolation is num2 greater than num1. And then here I will put the result. Let's press control F5 to see that indeed is six greater than five true. We made a typo here, so let me fix that greater than. All right, so if I say here, instead of six, if I say four, then now this is false because four is not greater than five. Let's see that. Let's see that indeed we have is four greater than five, false. Now, just like we have greater than, we have less than. So let's do that. Let's say here is num2 less than num1 equal to num2 less than num1, semicolon here. And now let me put that on the screen, less than, and let's put here this value. All right, so we can press Control F5 one more time, and we're going to see that is four less than five. Of course, it is true. And also, we can see that if we put here a six, now this is going to be false. So let me press Control F5, and let's see that is six less than five, false. Now, we have been using different values between these two variables. What if I have the same value in each of those variables? Well, in this case, both Boolean expressions are going to be false. Is five greater than five? False. Is five less than five? Also false. Why is that? Well, because five is equal to five. So it is not less than five, it is five. But what if we want to check if a number, for example, is less than or equal to another number? And the same goes for greater than or equal to another number. Well, for that, we have another operator. Let's see that. Let me come here and let's say bar is num2 greater than or equal to num1 equal to num2 greater than or equal to num1. So we have this operator here, which is the greater than or equal to, which checks if num2 is either greater than num1 or equal to num1. The same goes for less than or equal to. We can put here less than or equal to num1. And here we can put, as you may imagine, less than and then equal. So less than or equal. And then we can copy this and put that here, greater than or equal to num1 less than or equal to and finally i can put this here and put this here and with this we can check that indeed now both of those are going to be true because yes five is equal to five and five is again equal to five and if i put here for example a six we are going to see that then we have is six greater than five true? Is six less than five false? Is six greater than or equal to five? Of course it is true. And is six less than or equal to five false again? Now, of course we can do comparisons with other data types. For example, let's come here. Let's say var date one equal to new date time. And let me say 2023 day one. And then bar date two, date time, 2024, one, one. Of course, date two is greater than date one, but let's check that. Let's say here, console, right line, and let's see what we have. 
is day two greater than date one and then the result is going to be day two i can put that directly here i don't have to put it in a variable if i don't want to greater than date one semicolon control f5 and we're going to see that we have is january 1 2024 and the time greater than january 1 2023 and the time and this is equal to true of course so as you can see we can definitely use our boolean expressions to ask questions about the values in our code and also besides using it with numbers we can also use dates or other data types as we will see in the future let's suppose that i want to know if num one is between 5 and 10 that is i want to figure out if num one is greater than 5 and if that same num one is less than 10. for that we have to use conditional boolean operators for example we can use the and operator which allows us to represent a boolean expression that returns true if both operands are equal to true let's see that let's say bar is between 5 and 10 so i have to say non 1 greater than 5 and non 1 less than 10 so as you can see this boolean expression is composed of two boolean expressions this is a boolean expression and this is another boolean expression and of course at the end we're going to have true because this is true and true again so we have true and true and because as i said before this expression this boolean expression returns true because both operands that is the value at the left of the and and the value at the right of the and are both true therefore this returns true let's see that let me say here console right line i just want you to see that this is equal to true control f5 and indeed we have true let me put here let me put it here the operator and let me put here what happens depending on the different values that we can have the different combination of values so we can have true and false this returns false false and true this returns false and false and false returns false so for example if i put here a four what are we going to have what are we going to have well is four greater than five no so we have false here and is four less than 10 of course this is true but because if we come here we can see that this will be false but before i show you this value on the console let me just say that since this was false i didn't really need to evaluate this because as we can see here if the first value is false then we can immediately conclude that the value will be false that the result will be false because there is no way that we get a true if the first value is false so with that out of the way let's just see that this is going to be false so let me press ctrl f5 and we can see that indeed this is false now this is not the only boolean conditional operator that we have another one is or the or operator this basically means this or that for example what if i want to find out if this num1 is equal to 4 or 5 so i can say here var is num1 4 or 5 equal to and i can say num1 equal equal 4 or num1 equal equal 5 so i'm basically asking two questions and i want to know if one of them is true and if one of them is true at least one of them is true then the whole expression will return true that is in this case we have is this true yes true or is this true no so this is false but because we already have one true we know that this will return true so let me just prove this to you let me put that 
on the console and let's see that indeed we have true. So if we do the same exercise that we did here, but with four, we're going to get the following true or true returns true, true or false returns true, false or true returns true. And finally false or false returns false. So as you can see here, only if we have both operands of the operator of the Boolean expression that we have here is that we're going to get false. Only if both are false is that we get false. If either the second one or the first one is true, then we get true. And if, and if both are true, then we get true. Just like we analyzed here that we said if the first value is false, then we get false here. If the first value is true here, then we already know that we're going to get true. There is an important consequence here. That is that because C-sharp wants to be efficient, it knows that if this is true, if we have an expression like this one, if this is true, then it doesn't even evaluate this second expression, this second Boolean expression that we have here. The same goes for this one. If this is false, then this doesn't even get evaluated. Again, that is for optimization purposes. We can exploit this fact to avoid the null reference exception that we saw in the previous module. Let's see that. Let's come here. Avoiding the null reference exception. Let's say a string nullable last name null. Now I want to know if this last name value is equal to Gavilan. All right. So let me do the following. Let me say var is last name equal to and uh, let me just come here just so that we don't have too much code distracting us like this equal to gavilan then i'll say assignment last name is different than null and last name and i want to use to uppercase because I want to analyze if this is equal to Gavilan in uppercase. Now, what are we doing here and why are we avoiding the null reference exception or how are we avoiding the null reference exception? Well, as we said, this is a conditional Boolean expression. So we have here a Boolean expression and another Boolean expression. Now, if this is false, then there is no need for C sharp to evaluate this Boolean expression that we have here, right? Now, if last name is equal to null, then this is going to be equal to false. And therefore, this will not get evaluated. Let's see that. Let's come here and let's say console write line. And I will just write is last name, is last name equal to Gavilan. And let me comment this out. And we're going to see that even though this is null, this code is protected by the fact that this will not get evaluated if this is false. So let me say control F5 to run our application. And we're going to see that we simply got false. We didn't have an exception. We got false. And of course, if I put here, if I put here Gavilan, because we're saying to upper here, we're going to convert this to uppercase. And therefore, we're going to compare it with Gavilan also in uppercase, and we're going to get true. So let's press Control F5 to run our application, and indeed we got true. So as I mentioned before, there are techniques that we can use to avoid having null reference exceptions in our code. This is just one of those techniques. Let's now learn one of the most useful techniques in any programming language, selection statements. Selection statements allows us to determine which lines of code are going to execute and which are not. Let's start with the if selection statement. The if selection statement allows us to execute a block of code if a Boolean expression is equal to true. For example, we have here num1 equal to 9, so I want to say if this is greater than 5, then I want to execute a specific block of code. So let me say here, if this is the if selection statement, we have to put a parenthesis and in that parenthesis, I have to put a Boolean expression that of course is going to evaluate either to true or false. And if it is true, then a block of code is going to execute. If it is false, then that block of code is not 
going to execute. Let's see that. Let me say num1 greater than 5 block of code. You know, we use curly bracket for defining block of codes. And we're going to say here, console red line, num1 is greater than 5, semicolon here, console right line, the end. All right, so what do we got here? We got a variable, and then we're asking a question about that variable. We're asking if that variable is greater than 5, and we're using the if selection statement, which means that if this Boolean expression is equal to true, and only if this expression is equal to true, is that we are going to execute this block of code. If this turns out to be false, then we are not going to execute this block of code. After that, whether we execute this block of code or not, we are going to execute whatever is after the end of this if statement. The end of this if statement is here. So anyway, if this is true or false, we are anyway going to execute this code. So let's see that. We can see that this is going to be true, right? Therefore, we expect to have this code run. So let's press Ctrl F5 to run our application, and we're going to get that we have num1 is greater than 5, so this line of code executed, and in the end, we have the end here. And if we come here, if we say 4, now this is false, and therefore, we expect this block of code not to be executed. So let's press Ctrl F5, and we're going to see that indeed we only have the end on the screen. Now again, selection statements are fundamental in any kind of programming language because they allow us to define what code is going to run and what code is not going to run depending on a Boolean expression. Now, of course, I'm not limited to having only one statement in this block of code. For example, I can come here and I can say console right line, and for example, I can say processing. This is just another statement. So I can put back here a nine or whatever other number that is greater than five, it doesn't matter. And I can press Ctrl F5 and we can see that we have num one is greater than five, processing and also the end. Now, what if I want to execute a specific block of code if this expression is equal to false? So that is like, I want to execute this block of code or this other block of code. For that we have else. Else basically means if I couldn't run this block of code, then please run this one. For example, here I can say console write line num1 is less than 5. Of course, because if we enter this block of code, it just means that this was false and therefore num1 is less than 5. Or should I say is less than or equal to 5 to be more exact. So again, if we press Ctrl F5, we're going to see that we have the exact same three messages on the console. But if I come here and say 4, for example, Ctrl F5, now we're going to see that we have num1 is less than or equal to 5 and the end. So as you can see, if this evaluates to true, we execute this block of code. And optionally, if we want to, we can add an else block of code which is going to execute if this is false. Now, if we want to have even more options, we can add an else if. This is a second condition that we can evaluate in the case that this first condition evaluates to false. For example, I can say else if num1 equal equal 3. Then here I can put some code, console right line, num1 is 3. So what do we have here? What is this? So let's go from the top. If num1 is greater than 5, we're going to execute this block of code. Now, if this is false, then we're going to fall to this second condition. We're going to see if num1 is equal to 3. If it is equal to 3, then we're going to execute this block of code, and we're going to be done with this if statement. After this, this the end is going to be executed. Now, if num1 is also not equal to 3, so therefore this also evaluates to false, then we're going to fall to the next else, and this one is going to execute if none of these ifs that we have here, if none of these conditions that we have here evaluate to true, 
then we're going to execute this block of code. So if none of this block of code execute, then we're going to execute this one. So let's see that. Let's go back here and let me say six. We're going to execute this block of code. Control F5 to run our application. And we can see that indeed we have non one is greater than five. All right. Now, if we say non one is equal to three, this will evaluate to false, but this will evaluate to true. And therefore we're going to run this block of code. So let me press Control F5. And we're going to see that indeed we have non one is three and the end. Finally, if we put something like four, for example, then this will evaluate to false, this will evaluate to false, and therefore we are going to execute this block of code. So let me say Control F5 to run our application one last time, and we're going to see that we have non one is less than or equal to five, and the end. The if statement is very important. Nevertheless, sometimes we can avoid using it by using the ternary conditional operator. This ternary operator is basically an abbreviated if else. A situation in which it is useful is when we want to assign a value to a variable based on a condition or on the result of a Boolean expression. So for example, we have here a Boolean user is login. So this can be true or false. And we have a welcome message. And we want to display a different welcome message if the user is logged in or not. If the user is logging, I want to write, glad you're back. But if the user is not logging, I want to write, login to start. So as you can see here, we have our if statement, and we're saying that if this is true, if whatever is here is true, then we're going to execute this block of code, which assigns the following value to the welcome message variable, glad we're back. And if this is false, then we're going to fall here to this else block of code and we're going to put login to start in the welcome message variable. And then in the end, we're going to console reline it. So let's see that since this is true, we're going to have glad you are back. Let's press control F5 to run our application and we're going to see that we have glad you are back. And if we put here false, we're going to have login to start as expected. Now, let's put this back as true, and let's see that some folks may not like this because there are too many lines of code for something as simple as just choosing the value of this variable. Something that we can do then is to use the ternary conditional operator. So we can do the following. Instead of this, I can comment this out, and I can say equal to user is login. Here we put the condition. What we put here, now we put it here. And then we put a question mark. This is the ternary conditional operator. And then we want to put here the value that we want to have here if this is true. So we're going to put here, glad you are back. Or here we put the value that we want to assign to this variable if this is equal to false. So here we're going to put this semicolon here. And as you can see with this one liner, we are doing exactly the same that we have here. Let me prove that to you. Let's see that we have true, and therefore we are going to have glad you are back. So control F5 to run our application, and we have glad you are back. And if we put here false, control F5, let's see that we have here login to start. Therefore, as you can see, this was just a simple abbreviation of this code. Now, notice that this worked because the only thing that we're doing here is that we're assigning a value to a variable, a value to the same variable. If the logic here was more complicated, more complicated code, and here also more complicated code, then this wouldn't work. This works because what we're doing here is just assigning a value to a variable, and therefore it is easy for us to put that here. Now, let me put here, just as an indication, let me put it here bar my variable equal to condition, the ternary operator, value if true, value if false. So as you can see, semicolon, so as you can see, if this is true, then the value of my variable is going to be this value that we put here. Otherwise, it is going to be this value that we put here if this condition, whatever it is, is false. 
And when I say condition, I mean Boolean expression, just I think it is more clear if I put here Boolean expression. So this is the ternary conditional operator. Another example of a selection statement is the switch statement. With a switch, we have a similar experience of the if, but with the switch we can abbreviate a little bit of the code, because the Boolean expression is only evaluated once. Let's see an example. As we can see here, we have place equal to a value, and then we have if place equals to one, we have one message, if place equal to two, another message, if place equal to three, another message, and finally, if none of these conditions are true, then we print out this message. Now, this code is not wrong, it definitely works, but we can avoid having to put place equal equal one, place equal equal two, place equal equal, and so on, by using a switch statement. Let's see. Let me comment this out, and let's come here, and let's say the following. Let me say switch, here we're going to put our value, which in our case is place, our place variable, and then I'm going to say case one, and then in here I will put whatever code I want to execute on that case that place is equal to one. Then after that, we're going to say, we have to say here break. Please notice something and notice that here we do not use blocks of code, but we use break to indicate that we're finishing this case. Now, I can say then case two, and then in here, I can put this, if place equals to two, I have this code, I'm going to put this here. So let's analyze what we have. What we have is that we're saying, please analyze this place variable. And if the value of place is equal to one, then please execute this code that we have here. Now, if case is equal to two, then please execute this code that we have here and so on. As you can see, I don't have to keep writing place equals to one, place equals to two, just like we did here, place equals to one, place equals to two, place equals to three, so I can save some code. Then let's do the same for k3, this, and then let me copy this code from here and put it here, then break to finish the case. And just like here we have an else, which basically means if none of this is true, then please do this, I have a default case, which is just default, which is basically the else of the switch statement. And in here I can put this message that we have here. And of course we have to put a break here to indicate that we're finishing our quote unquote block of code. Of course, there is not a block of code here. I'm just using the word block of code as an analogy in this case. And this works. Let's execute our code. Let's see that we have place equal to two. Let me press control F5 to run our application. And we're going to see that we have you are in second place because place is equal to two and therefore we fall to this case and we execute this code. Of course, I can have several lines of code here. I can say console right line, another line of code. I can have several lines of code here. There is no problem with that. Let me run this just so that you can see that we have those two lines of code executing. What if I want to have it so that I have the same code for two cases? For example, let me say that I want to say case four console right line, you almost made it. And let's say that I want to have the exact same code run when place is equal to five. So I can say case five, and it is the same. If place is equal to four, then we're going to execute this code. And if place is equal to five, then again, we're going to execute this code. We can check that right away. Let's put here four, and we're going to see that we have you almost made it, and also if I put here a five, then we're going to see that indeed we have again the same message, you almost made it. Similar to the ternary operator, we can use switch expressions to assign a value to a variable from several choices. For example, let's see the code that we did in the previous video. We have place, and then we say that we want to print a message depending on the value of place. So if it is equal to one, we want this message, or this one, or this one, or this one, or this one. Now, if you think about it, 
What we're really doing here is that we have the same logic that we want to print a different message depending on the value of place, but we're not doing anything different in any of these cases that we have in this switch statement. So we can actually change our code to be less repetitive. Let's see that. Let me say here bar message. So what I want to do is that I want to assign one of these messages, one of these strings into this message variable. Now, as we said, something that we can use is a switch expression that is going to allow us to abbreviate this code even more. So let's do the following. Let me say place switch. And then in here I can say one. And then in here I can put what I want to be the value of message. If place is equals to one, we're going to see this symbol in the future. This is called the Lambda operator. And we're going to use it a lot in the future. But for now, just know that what we're saying here is that if place is equal to one, then the value of message is going to be this string that we have here. Now we can do the same for the other possible values of place. Let's put a comma here, not a semicolon, but a comma here, then two. And the value of message is going to be this value that we have here. Now let's do the same for three comma. And now we have something very interesting and that is that we have four or five. How do we express this in a switch expression? Well, in here we can say four or five. If the value of place is four or five, then we're going to say that the value of the message variable is going to be this value that we have here. Finally, we have our else, which here was a default, but here we can use something that is called discard in C sharp, which in this context means none of the above. So here we're going to say if none of the above, then we're going to say this, this is our default case. So let me put this here and let me put a semicolon here. Now I can comment this out. And as you can see, we have abbreviated our code. Now, of course we need to do a console write line. So let me just copy and paste this here and let me put message here and let's see what we get. Let's see that we can press control F5 and we're going to see that we have, you almost made it. If place is equal to five. Now, if place is equal to one, for example, then we're going to get, you are in first place as you can see here. So we have a switch expression that we can use. For example, if we want to assign a value to a variable, depending on the value of another variable, like place in this case, we can make switch expressions more complex by using relational patterns. This allows us to make comparisons with constants. For example, we can use a switch expression in which instead of saying, for example, is place equal to one, then do this, is place equal to two, then do that. You can say, is this variable greater than this value or is this variable less than this value? Then do that. So let's see an example. Let me delete this. I'll delete everything and I'll say temperature equal to 35, for example. And I will say bar message temperature. I'm going to use again a switch expression switch. And then I will say, if temperature is 37, then we're going to say you are healthy comma. We're going to say greater than 37. So we're saying that if the temperature is greater than 37, then the value of message is going to be you have fever. And then we're going to say less than 37. And then we will say you may be low on sugar semicolon here. And now we can say console red line message. So what do we have here? As you can see here, we have a switch expression on the temperature value. And what we're saying is that if temperature is equal to 37, then we're going to return you are healthy. If temperature is greater than 37, then we're going to have you have a fever. And finally, if temperature is less than 37, we will have this message. Now, as you can see here, I'm covering all of the possibilities, whether temperature is 37, 
whether it is greater than 37 or whether it is less than 37. But what if I do this? What if I say 35, for example? So I'm not covering for the case in which temperature is equal to 36. And as you can see here, we're getting a warning. We're getting a warning because now values like 35 is not covered, but if I say less than or equal to 35, anyway, I have a warning here because now 36 is not covered. So as you can see from the C Sharp compiler, so that we can know if there are some missing cases that we're not handling. So let's see what happens. First, I want to put here 37 because this is the easiest case. Let's see that we have your healthy. That is not surprising. Now, greater than 37 for now for example 41 this is obviously in celsius so you have fever and then let's say 35 we have you may be low on sugar now if i put 36 what is going to happen well if we run the application we're going to see that we have a exception we have another exception we have a switch expression exception we saw that in the past we had a null reference exception that was one kind of exception. Now this is another kind of exception, the switch expression exception, which means that we enter the switch expression with a value that is not represented here. And therefore we got back an error. So our application has stopped working. Now that is why we have this warning here, because we are being warned that this may break our application. So one way to fix it is to say control dot, a default case and then in here we get this default case which is going to cover whatever is not covered here of course if i don't want to use a default case i can just come here and make sure that i'm covering all of the cases we can combine different patterns by using not and and or for example let's start with not the idea of not is a negation and although we saw in the past that we can use a negation operator, when we're using patterns, we use not. For example, let me say here, a string, last name, Gavilan. I can say if last name is not null, so I can ask if last name is not null, and then I will execute this block of code only if last name is not null. So then I can safely access a member of last name. For example, I can say last name to upper, and this is safe. I will not get a null reference exception because I know that last name is not null. And finally, I can write here console right line D N. So I can press Ctrl F5 to run our application and we're going to see that indeed we have Gavilan in uppercase here. So let me close this and let's see what else we got. We can make an example with AND, which as you may imagine, will allow us to have a Boolean expression in which we're going to get true only if both operands are true. For example, I can say bar temperature equal to 38 and let's use a switch expression let's say bar message temperature switch 37 you are fine then i can say for example if it is greater than 37 and less than 39 so basically what i'm asking is is this value greater than 37 and also less than 39 so if both are true then we're going to get you have fever then i can say greater than or equal to 39 and less than 43 you must go to the doctor and if it is greater or equal to 43 we can put whatever message we want and also just for completeness 37 less than 37 you may be low on sugar so semicolon here so as you can see we can use and which is similar to our and that we use outside of patterns. So let me delete this and let me say console right line message. Let me just print, for example, if this is 38, it is going to be this one. So control F5. And as you can see here, we have, you have a fever on the console. Now, finally, we have or. 
example three, or which is similar to what we saw in the past with this double pipe operator. So this will return true if at least one of the operands are true. Let's see an example of that. Let's come here and let's say season equal to daytime. Let's go to daytime. Let's go to today's value month. And depending on which month we are in, we are going to say on what season we are. So let me say switch and I will say if we are on month three or four or five, then we are in spring. If we are on month six or seven or eight, we are in summer. Nine or 10 or 11, fall. And finally 12 or one or two, that's winter, semicolon here. Now, as you can see here, we have a warning because this is an integer. This month member is an integer and we're not covering every single possible integer here. So what we can do is to say control dot at default case. And what we're going to do, and this is something that we're going to study later in the course, we are throwing an exception. We can throw our own exceptions, our own errors. In this case, I'm saying throw new exception that is called not implemented exception. And by its name, you may guess that this is an exception that we throw when a line of code is run that shouldn't have been run. And then let's come here and let me say console write line season, which is this variable that we have here. All right. So for example, in my case, I am recording this in February, which means that I'm going to get winter. So let me say control F5 to run our application. And now we have here winter. So as you can see, we can use logic patterns like not and and or to combine different patterns.